Hey everyone, welcome to Know Your Gear QA Live Podcast episode 315. And I hope you guys have a great, had a great week. I say have had a great week. The week's over, right? So on to the new three-day weekend. Uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for joining me live or watching the rebroadcast. I appreciate it every week. And as always, if you see somebody with a blue name and a blue wrench, that means they're a moderator. They're here to help with small issues, questions, you name it. Uh, and if you see somebody with a green name, it just means they're a channel member. Channel members are people who pay uh, to support the pro uh, uh, broadcast, the show every week. Uh, just like the patrons support this show every week. It's been 315 episodes sponsored solely by you guys and uh, no companies. So I think that's uh, something that we should always basically uh, say thank you. Actually, the bigger thank you besides all of that new people who uh, who watch and and comment and, and and subscribe and all that stuff is, you know, a lot of the patrons because the, the channel members knew a lot of the patrons we were looking at it, like 60, 70 percent of the patrons have been with us for almost four years. <laughs> so thank you. That's pretty off the charts. I was just really not thinking about that when we were looking at that this week. Okay, so a couple things to talk about. It's Memorial Day weekend. We're going to talk about, of course, Memorial Day sales for a second. But also, I always like to point out, just because it seems to always be confusing for people, I don't know why, in, in uh, Memorial Day. Um, we celebrate Memorial Day here in the U.S. I know other countries celebrate a version of it uh, as well. And um, Memorial Day is for all of the people who gave their lives uh, for us. And also to thank the families of and friends of the people who have lost someone who has done something to uh, make our lives better, improve our lives, keep our lives safe, um, all of those things. And the reason I always say that every Memorial Day weekend uh, since we've been doing this show is um, sometimes I know some people get confused and uh, I've I accidentally, somebody will say, thank you for your service or something like that to me knowing that I was prior service on Memorial Day weekend. And I always remind them, um, Veterans Day is when you would want to celebrate a veteran, someone who has served. But Memorial Day is the day uh, and the weekend that we remember the ones we we can't actually say thank you to anymore. And that's when we think about them. So I just always want to make sure that's clear. And also, um, uh, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's enough. Um, oddly enough, and I don't know about you guys, uh, there's Memorial Day sales. I always find this strange. I don't know how to handle that particular thing. It always is a little cringeworthy. So I just want to let you know, I've never really understand that. <laughs> Why somebody would be like, hey, it's Memorial Day. So let's do a sale. I always think that's such a strange thing. Like I get Valentine's Day, Christmas, Christmas sales. Like I get that. It's a holiday. Like, you know, uh, this seems like I said, there, it just seems a little odd, but Let's be honest, we are a gear channel and there are sales. So um, of course, like everybody's running some sales. The reason I'm talking about it is not because I want you guys to know about the sales uh, particularly. I just know that one of the things we talk about besides guitars is everything guitar here. So guitars, amps, uh, you know, pedals, the industry, repair, you name it. If it's guitar related, we talk about it. Well, the as an industry indicator, the, these kind of these sales tell you a lot. And looking at the sales, uh, especially the preview, I've sent some previews like Sweetwater um, previews of sales. In other words, you know, you see it ahead of time. That's what's coming because they want you to share it. Because if you click the links, like I put the link to the Sweetwater one below, if you click a link and buy some of those pedals on clearance, they kick back some money to the channel. So it's a, it's a nice way to support the channel. It doesn't cost you anything if you, that's, if you're something going to do that already. But before I ever share that, if you, if you noticed during the pandemic, I did not share the sales. I mentioned them, but I didn't say, hey, I didn't have a link. You can go back to those videos and see exactly what I what I did if there wasn't a deal um, because I'm not going to share it. And I'm not part of the I don't want to be part of that. You know, hey, there's zero percent off. Buy it. <laughs> or, you know, it was not real discount. A lot of a lot of fake discounts during covid where they were like regularly ninety nine dollars on sale. Ninety nine dollars, you know, but this is legit. I saw some stuff fifty percent off. I'm going to show you the one I saw. I'm going to share with you if you're looking for a deal. I'm going to show you uh, something. Oh, just realized, like, should I buy it real quick before you guys so I get one? I'm not going to buy it, okay? But uh, but I'll share it with you, okay? Here it is. Uh, I thought this was one of the best deals. Uh, this is the Steel String Clean Drive. And, um, and, uh, it's regularly like 
it says two hundred dollars. I don't know if that's the real price if it's normally two hundred dollars, but ninety nine dollars for this pedal seems to be pretty legit. This is a well, uh, uh, well liked pedal, and it's pretty cool. So I, you know, like I said, I, I put a link to all the pedals. Let me go back. Oops, wrong screen. Do I have the right screen? Can I go back? I can't go back. Here you go. All right. Um, like, oh, I thought this too. The HX Stomp, regularly seven hundred bucks, five fifty five, which great. You know, and I want to talk about this. Um, this is a great deal because um when i reviewed the aux let me go back to this i told this story before i'm gonna tell it real quick just so you guys know where i'm coming from when when the aux came out every youtube channel had one and then all of a sudden i noticed like all the rock stars had them too and i saw them everywhere and i was like oh is it really good or are they just sending it to everybody or is it they sending it to everybody and it's really good you know you just don't know and i had no relationship with aux uh or aux with uh uh universal audio i still i still don't i don't know any of those uh cats but um uh, I was talking to Sweetwater one day and they wanted me to do a video. I forgot what about. It was something, but it wasn't like a gear related video. But I did the video. And when we were talking about how we could work together, I said, hey, could you send me an aux? I really want to try one out. And they sent one. And I've had many discussions now about why I like the aux and why I like the Captor X. And you can watch my videos talking about that. But the one thing that I want to share with you that was really interesting and it ties into this is a legitimate uh, thing to think about is that when... Sweetwater sent me the aux. It was $11.99. So I made a video, and in the video, I said it was $11.99. Now, what I do when I make a video is I send it to the patrons. The patrons get to preview it, so the members. And then usually that's where they go, hey, you misspelled this, or hey, you said this, but I don't know if you meant that. Or also, you know, hey, Phil, the screen j jumped so fast, I didn't see this thing. You know, they just kept critiques, right? Um, they're like a fo focus group for the channel, so they kind of make the videos better, for sure. And... Um, one of the things that happened was uh, when I was previewing it and they were they were watching it, I realized the price jumped from $11.99 to $13.99. And I was like, oh. So I had to go and edit it. And then what happened was I didn't have time. I was doing something. A couple weeks went by and then it went to $14.99. So in a, in a short period of time between I got the aux, which when it was $11.99, to when I did that video, it was $14.99. Now it's on sale for $11.99. So I'm telling you that because I can tell you this. Although the inflation and stuff, all that stuff, um, all that stuff factored in, you, you know, we all have opinions about that for sure. But I just want to let you know, $11.99 for the aux is what it was basically right before all that inflation, you know, kicked up. So if you were thinking about getting one, that's probably legit price point for that too. It's an expensive item. Um, obviously, I love mine. You know, I still use it every single day. And um, and if $1,199 obviously is a crazy amount of money to spend, because it is, that's why I, I try to figure out a way that I could negotiate to, you know, I bartered to get mine because I just, I couldn't justify it uh, without knowing if it was good or not. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, and I say it every time, the Captor X for half the price to me does, it's enough to make you happy. Like, I mean, it will do an, everything that you need to do. And then, like I said, in a lot of ways, it's actually better. In a couple ways, I like the aux a little better, but you're not missing out. But I just want to share that with you. And then um, anything else? Let's go back. Oh yeah, like I said, that uh, that Helix, the, or, sorry, the Helix, the HX Stomp 549. That's what I paid for mine right before the pandemic. So these seem like pretty real discounts overall on some things. Um, this uh, this uh, Universal Audio Dream pedal, um, right? Uh, three. I thought it was two ninety nine. Then it was three ninety nine. Now it's three nineteen. So again, some some cool stuff there. And it, like I said, if you use my link, then I make uh, a lot of money, like a lot, like enough to buy eggs and a tank of gas. If all of you buy it, <laughs> I just wanted to make an eggs and gas joke. Nothing like trying to get people to buy stuff by reminding them how crappy inflation is. Okay, so. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into, uh, other subjects. Okay. So that's, uh, what I talked about. Let's, uh, let's talk about what, what are we going to talk about? We got some early riser questions. I'm going to hop in that stuff. We got some crazy stuff that Kat sent to me this week that I want to talk about. Um, the, uh, what else? Hold on a second. It's funny. On a side note, I'm normally drinking water, which I have right here. I um, drink water pretty much every episode. Today, for the first time in probably years, literally years, may, at least 100 episodes, if not more, so it gives you a reference, I'm drinking an iced coffee. I don't know if you can see it. Um, uh, and because uh, I'm tired. <laughs> 
I'm not tired for from work. I uh, I uh, it's uh, hot here in Arizona. I just want to let you know I'm trying to keep my energy up. Uh, my wife wanted to go for a walk. We went for a hike this mo morning. Hike meaning it was like 97, 98 degrees when we went for the hike. 97, and it was a good hike. And then afterwards, we, we, you know, got back, cleaned up and went to lunch and I had uh, pho and uh, it's very filling. So it was kind of like a good workout and then a huge meal. And then I got the afternoon lull right now. So uh, coffee, I have coffee. I'm just letting you guys know that. That's why I have coffee. And if you see me switching drinks, that's why it's because I need water to keep my, you know, my palate going. So I can talk and I want coffee to, for the caffeine, for the symbolism in my head that's says caffeine is good. Uh, Tampa Blue says you can afford eggs and gas. Yeah, as long as I trade a guitar for them. <laughs> we're gonna done, we're gonna done, done with those jokes. Okay, so uh, should I hit some early rides or questions or should it go some of the weekly questions? I'm gonna hit the weekly question. We got a, a question sent to the uh, knowyourgearpodcast.com website. That's where you can send in questions and if we find them interesting, we pick them and put them in folders and pull them up now. And this one was an interesting one. Um, because a viewer sent this question and said, Hey, Phil, a guitar store YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, said Fender opened a music store in Japan and, and it, and it is a bit, and isn't it? No. Okay. Hold on. Let me reread this. Sorry. They, they did mess up the question a little bit. So let me just, let me just uh, explain it the way I think I understand it. They're saying a YouTube channel that's also a music store said that Fender opened a guitar store, music store in Japan. And is it a big leap to think that if it does well, they'll open more, including ones in the USA? Um, so that was an interesting question. And here's why. Um, because I know you're probably thinking I'm going to go yes or no, but actually I'm going to tell you exactly what I think is really going to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, what obviously what will happen is companies, uh, and obviously I think Fender, oh, actually I know Fender is one. Uh, and when I say I know, I mean, I know they're trying, so I know they're one. Companies are going to, are, <coughs> I'm sorry, my throat's going dry from the coffee. Okay. Companies are getting into competition against their dealers as we speak. So I know what you're thinking. You're going, oh yeah, because Fender sells direct online. So when you buy a main Mexico Strat, you can buy that from Sweetwater or Guitar Center or your local mom and pop shop, or you can buy it direct from Fender. But the reality is that's only part of the story. See, Fender is also has an affiliate program. And what that means is just like how Sweetwater has an affiliate program, that speech I gave earlier about, hey, if you click that link, how that works for me, so you guys know, is if you were to buy that pedal for $99, I would get $4, generally speaking, okay? Um, there's a lot of caveats. So I don't want, you, when I say this stuff, it, you gotta understand like a lot of things in business, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things like, you, like if this, then it equals this. And if it's this, so what I mean by that is in a perfect world, it's in stock right now, you click it, you buy it. I probably get about $4, close to it, $3 and change, okay? And that's what I get for everyone sold. So that's pretty good. So if I, 100 of you buy them, I get 300 bucks, three to $400. It's pretty good. Uh, however, Fender has the same deal. So um, I could send you straight to Fender. I could say, hey, you go to Fender and uh, if you buy something on their website, I will get a commission. Here's the difference though. The difference though is that what does Fender get if I send you to the Fender instead of Sweetwater? Well, Sweetwater is gonna have about a 35 to 40% margin. That's my guess based on Sweetwater's size. I'm pretty sure that's about right, about 40%, usually about 10% more. They could have a 50% margin. I don't know for sure. and I, They're not gonna tell me and I'm not gonna ask, but I'm just giving you a guess because I know that a mom and pop, typical Fender store dealer will have about a 30% margin. So obviously if it's a $100, Fender item, like a hundred dollar Fender pedal, the, the store would expect to make $30 on that sale if you don't get a discount and uh, minus credit card processing fees and other things. Sweetwater would probably expect this uh, to get 35 to 40%, like I said, 10% more because they're buying a much bigger volume and much bigger dealer. So imagine if you buy that hundred dollar pedal and I send you to Fender directly and you buy it, Fender would give me the $4 that Sweetwater would give me but Sweetwater is giving me the $4 out of the $30 they make. Now you have to assume that if Fender could sell that same pedal to $60 of Sweetwater, they just sold it to you for $100. They made $96, not profit, but they made $96.
they made them probably, uh, I don't think their margins are double. I don't know. Because again, all products have different levels. So in other words, some products they can make 10% on. Some products they can make three times, four times what they pay for it. They could buy a product for $10 and sell it to you for 100. And they could buy a product for 100 or build a product for 100 and sell it to you for 120. So it's different. But the important part of the story is, is that Fender is not only selling direct to consumers, which is in direct competition to the dealer network, they are actively trying to get you to go there. <laughs> so they're not just saying like, this is past the years in the past when companies would go, well, we're just putting the stuff on our website. And obviously if a customer wants to buy it, but we're not, you know, we're not putting them on sale. Well, yeah, they're not putting them on sale, which they could do. Let's be fair. Obviously Fender could discount the 30%. Uh, which is what, so you know where where my mindset is. To me, if the manufacturer wants to go to direct, I understand that. I think they should, you know, right? Um, I, we live in a world of the internet, so the factory should be direct and have retailers. I think there's a way to, for those to both work out. However, I don't think the, the manufacturer should go into competition direct. Hey, let's head-to-head -head fight, like I said, with the retailers. And that's what these new world changes are going to be in the future. In other words, like I said, you're going to see these manufacturers actively going out there and you're going to see the the YouTube channels, the the, the Instagram, the TikTok channels, like all of a sudden they're like, hey, I got this cool Fender iPhone, <laughs> I don't know, whatever Fender sales. And uh, you can get the link down below. And of course, that's what they're doing now for Sweetwater and uh, other affiliate companies, right? Um, but, but what's different is, is that, uh, uh, you know, Fender's doing that against Sweetwater. In other words, they're doing it against the companies that are buying from them. And so here's what I will say. I will say this same thing that we talked about a few months ago. I remember talking about something like this, and I can only give this advice to all the dealers out there, the mom and pop dealers out there. And again, I'm not saying you should listen to me. I'm just giving you a perspective of not a guy who had a store for a while. That's not, that's not relevant to this conversation. What's relevant to this conversation is this, what I do now right? As a, I make content, you guys watch it. It gets millions of views per year and people are clicking things. Um, I would not, me personally, I would not recommend anybody working with any company that obviously doesn't have your best interest aligned with their best interest. And I think the days of, uh, for a lot of companies, there's, uh, not a lot of companies that are going to, to do that. In other words, so a lot of companies are going to be more focused in just the bottom line, the bottom dollar. Um, for, for instance, I was having an interesting conversation with a friend at Paul Reed Smith Guitars, and they were saying how Paul Reed Smith Guitars would never sell direct to customers. And my comment was, well, what if you don't have a choice? What if one day everyone else does and companies like, you know, again, we're just using Fender because they're the big company. They could take it, take it, take the conversation. If they're making 30 to 40% more per purchase than you are, I said, what do you think they're going to do with that money? Well, sure, they're going to give it to the investors as a dividend, but they're also going to double down and invest that in marketing, which means you will get crushed by the massive amount of profit they'll be making or that profit, in, you know, uh, gains and you'll be competing against them. So I think this is the future. I think manufacturers, a lot of manufacturers are going to do it. This is the same future that was brought to us by going overseas, right? Um, like I've made the comment before, uh, PV gets a lot of crap for going overseas and kind of killing the USA uh, factories. And uh, and I've always said, but they were one of the last ones to do it. And I think that's why they got so much attention for, for doing it because everybody else had, had left. When I remember growing up, I remember the big, for me, and everybody's gonna have different memories because your age, of course. For me, the big three affordable amp companies in the music stores was Crate, Randall, PV. Like if you didn't have Marshall money, if you didn't have Fender money, right, Vox money, you had, well, there was second tier. I'd call that second tier, actually. You had PV Crate Randall money. If you didn't have that money, then it was like Gorilla Amps, CMC, you name it, right? Like all the off-brand stuff. But, but, honest, and think about this. We're talking about, the t we're talking about, well, the 90s. We're talking about in the 90s. In the 90s, you would walk into a music store and there would be a Randall, a Crate, and a PV amp in your store, or in a store, affordable price amplifiers, all three made in the USA. So obviously as they went overseas and what happened was exactly that, they were making the amps a lot cheaper, keeping the margins for themselves because they were obviously getting bigger margins, taking that money, built, 
advertising against their competitors and their competitors had to follow. So I think this will be a trend we'll see. That brings me up to a second thing. If you see here, there's a case. I'm going to do something today I've, I haven't done before. Uh, I have a new guitar. I bought a new guitar. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. About my voice. I don't think drinking the coffee was a good idea. Okay. So, um, what do I have here? I have a new guitar. I bought a new guitar. Uh, it's a crazy guitar. I'd like to share the story with you guys. I don't know if I will. So here's what I decided to do for fun. Um, we're going to play a game. It's called, if we get 500 likes on the show, I don't think we've ever gotten that many. <laughs> I'll share the guitar with you. In fact, it doesn't matter when it happens in the show, I'll just stop and we'll share what guitar this is. And then if we get 2000 likes on the show, re rebroadcast, um, it's not so much I will, but that will tell me that we definitely want to do a review of it. And I'll do a deep dive of it. I'll do a full review. It takes two full days to do a, a deep dive video for me uh, on a guitar like this. And this, like I said, I didn't buy this for the channel. This is my personal guitar. In fact, it's a guitar. Um, it has a whole story. <laughs> it has a whole, whole reason why I bought it. And it's uh, and maybe it's interesting or not. I don't know. Um, Ian says, have a beer instead. No, that, the beer would make things worse. Okay. Um, somebody's like, it's not, it's not a Rick. It's, I'll tell you what it is. If you guys want to be teased with it, it's freaking expensive. So it's, it's crazy expensive. It's a guitar that, um, it's one of those, like, I'm not sure why I did this. I haven't rationally come up with a good reason why I did it, but I'm happy I did it. So there you go. There you go. Um, okay. Next, are we done with this subject? Do we kind of cover the Fender thing? I think we did. I think we did. So basically, the answer to your question is, uh, with that store, do I think Fender will open stores? That's basically what his question was, and I went on that tirade. Uh, no, I don't think they're going to open stores. They don't have to. They're going to do what a lot of companies are doing. They're going to get influencers to push their product directly. Look, you don't need a brick-and-mortar store if you got... 50 YouTube channels constantly reminding you, like I just did for Sweetwater, hey, click the link down below, right? My my joke is, or comment, I should say, is imagine that instead of a YouTube channel, I was a, a band. And as a band, I could get 20, 30, 40,000 people to come see me. And imagine at the end of the show, if I said, hey, if you liked everything you heard tonight, Rick's music, it's right there. Just go in that door. And all I got to do is get a small percentage of this, the crowd to go in there and buy some stuff. That would be huge for that store, right? That's basically what's happening on the digital realm. That link I pointed down to is essentially the door to the front of that store, which is Sweetwater, or it's going to be Fender or whatever. And if only a small per percentage of you go, there you go, right? I mean, that's huge. It's a massive thing. So uh, like I said, and sadly enough, and I'd like to point this out, and this is the last thing that's important, is... I, I kind of feel, I feel vindicated watching companies do this, the manufacturers, because I've had conversations with big companies, uh, big retailers and midsize retailers and telling them that they're not jumping on fast enough, in my opinion, to this market, which is super cheap. The influencer slash influencer slash affiliate slash, right. They all say, and some companies will tell me like, oh, we have a program. I'm like, you don't have a strategy, so you don't have a program. Um, and the sad thing is, um, I think manufacturers, some of the manufacturers are paying attention too and going, Hey, look, we see who's winning. We see who's not growing as fast. If they're not going to do it, we're going to do it. And what Fender probably could never do in a million years is open 300 music stores and go against Guitar Center. There'd be no logic to do that. Plus the expense, the time, but they can get 500 influencers to point you at an affiliate link. That's pretty powerful. So too bad, too bad Guitar Center and those guys didn't jump on fast enough to do that, in my opinion. I Like I said, I always, and I'll say this again, I think it's too late. You know, you shouldn't say it's never too late, but I've said it before. I think if they would have jumped on two years ago, they had a shot. But now they're going to be chasing forever. It's just moved too far ahead. It's like trying to, like I said, it's like picking on, it's like trying to decide right now that you think you're going to go to compete with Amazon and see how that goes. See how it goes. So we'll see. Like I said, I'm, by the way, I'd like to point out again one more time. <laughs> I'm not for or against any of this. I'm just explaining it. So sometimes people will confuse that. They're like, oh yeah, don't you like what they're doing? I'm like, no, I don't like what they're doing. I just understand why they're doing it. 
and I'm explaining that they're doing it. That's it. Just sharing it. So. Okay. <laughs> so he says, what is the internet? All right. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, Matt. Matt. Uh, I want to say Brillhart. I hope I hope I got it right, Matt. Matt says, hey, Phil, I was offered a 80, 1989 USA Squire Strat for my 72 Fender Music Man bass amp. Not certain the value of the pseudo rare USA Squire. Will it maintain over time like a tube amp? Thoughts. Okay, so I don't want to talk about your particular trade, but I can help you understand what you need to be focused on as I've done so much trading in my life. And as someone who didn't enjoy trading, like I said, I I, I had the shop, but there was reasons why I had the shop. I like guitars. <laughs> I wanted to be around guitars and hang around guitar players all day. So I was like, hey, let's open up a shop. Um, so there are things you have to learn to do, obviously, like learn to sell. I didn't have any sales tactics or techniques or anything. I was like, I just like, oh, I better learn how to sell stuff, <laughs> right? I better learn how to better learn how to use a register. You know, the things you learn, one of the things you learn is how to trade. And there are some certain rules I can give you on trades and they will always, always help you understand what, why you should or shouldn't do a trade. Okay. So let me give you some basic rules of trading for lack of a, for lack, just to keep me focused. Let's say that there's three major rules of trading, uh, trade up, trade out, or let's call it trade for love. Okay. So trade up, that's easy. So if you want to trade with somebody or somebody wants to trade anything with you, whether it's guitars, pedals, amps, of course, we're keeping it gear centric. It's a clear yes decision. If you're trading up, in other words, if it's better, okay, you're not looking for equal. Okay. Not yet. We'll get there. So in other words, trade up, trade up, um, trade up is easy. It could be a monetary thing. So in other words, they want to trade you a thing that's definitely worth a thousand dollars or your thing that's definitely worth $600. That's a trade up value wise. It's, and I'm talking about something that's quantifiable, guaranteed, like, yes, that sells for a thousand, your sales for six. They want to do the trade trading up. Good decision. No emotions involved, just good trade. Okay. Trade out is, uh, is the next one trade out is desperation on your end. You have something, you can't sell it. Nobody wants it. You're sick of it. It's too big. It's too small, whatever it is that you can't find use. There's no convenient fast way for you to sell it. Or maybe like I said, you might have time constraints, whatever it is you need to get out of it. So that's why you're trading out of it. So if, even if you take a trade that maybe not in your favor, if the win is that you got rid of it, Think of it that way, like, oh, so, and these are all tr ways I decided to do trades in the store. Somebody would come up if I was trading up, like, hey, I, I really want, Phil, I really want that Mexican Strat. I, I, I know it sounds stupid, but I have a Les Paul studio and I just hate my studio and I want that Strat. Will you trade me? And I'd be like, yeah, I can sell a used Les Paul studio for a thousand back in the day. And the Mexican Strat was <coughs> 600 bucks. This is a great trade. Let's do this, right? Smart business 101, do it. That was it. Trade out, same thing. C customer comes to the store, maybe it flipped. Maybe I had a horrible Les Paul that I couldn't sell and it sat and rotted and rotted and rotted for years. And now they're offering something and maybe it's a little less value, but I can at least flip that and get out of it. So trade out. So same thing with you, if you're trading out, cause you want to get rid of it. Like you have a big bass amp and a small guitar is going to be a better fit in your house than this big bass amp. The last trade is trade for love. That is when it's a good trade because you want it. Okay. That's a super easy thing to me. I find the trade for love always looks the same to me. In other words, you tend to always take a lot of things and come out with one thing. So what I mean by that is you take a pile of stuff, trade it to somebody for a single thing that you really want and you really want it bad. So that's the trade for love idea um, or trading because you love something. Um, when it sounds to me, you're not trading for emotional reasons. There's not, obviously you don't have any interest in this guitar and that's how most trades go. And that's why you need to pay attention to trading because a lot of people picture like, you want this thing, you'll trade for it. But most trades are exactly that. You have something you want to sell and somebody just emails you or message you on a forum or a Craigslist and says, I have this thing I'll trade you for. And a lot of times you're just thinking like, oh, well, mine's worth a thousand. There's worth 1100. Maybe I should do the trade. If that works for you, if you find that, that getting that hundred dollars is good for you, um, then do it. But in Mike's, my experience, I don't do trades like that. Like I said, 
has to fit in one of those criteria. I'm either trading up, trading out of something, or I'm trading for something I really, really want. And I follow those rules for myself and it does me well. So I'll give you those three to consider. <coughs> Excuse me again. Like I said, I don't think I'm going to do well today. All right. Okay. Uh... <laughs> David says, trade trade because of boredom. Yeah, you look, there's a ton of reasons you're going to come up with. I'm going to say that for most of the scenarios you guys come up with, I bet you one of the three that I pointed out is the reason you're doing it, right? You're trading out because you're bored with the product, right? That makes sense. Uh, like I said, uh, I, 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 is it not like, I know it seemed like I pulled that from my ass, so to speak, those three, but it is something that I, maybe I didn't hone the sayings or anything uh, over the years, but that's the rules I've been following. And like I said, and it's very important to me because, uh, you know, when you're in business, you can literally kill your, your financial, your, you know, your, your profits, if you don't have some system like that. And so that's how I did that. You know, a lot of companies like Guitar Center, they do trades and it's all basically, you know, plugged in. They plug it in and they go, oh, this is what it's selling for. This is how many we have our system. That's great. For me, as a guitar store owner and the person working the store, I would have a more of an emotional response. So I would have to kind of make sure that I was centered because sometimes I would trade things just because, you know, like you might trade. I'd be like, oh, theirs is red and we have a blue one on the wall and I like red better than blue. So let's trade. Maybe that's a good reason to trade, but not for a store, right? Because I wasn't trading up, trading out, or trading for something I loved. So that's how I do it. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, DJ wants to says, hey, Phil, I really want a hollow body with a, a piezo system, piezo system. And it says, uh, but would you recommend the Paul Reed Smith SE2 or the Schechter EA? Um, I've owned both. I love both. Uh, Schechter EA, I'm a Schechter freak. So I think Schechter's quality is hard to beat for anybody. Uh, of those two guitars, I can tell you without a doubt, I preferred the Paul Reed Smith the way it sounded. For sure. It was the, that PRS is better. The PRS import SE hollow body two sounds better than my American one, in my opinion, having both. And, uh, but that being said, it is a very chunky neck. It is chunkier than the USA Paul Reed Smith neck. So as someone who's always focused on the necks, the one thing I would tell you is that EA from Schechter is going to have a much smaller neck. That EA neck will be more like a Fender Mexican Strat, maybe even a little thinner. And the uh, Paul Reed Smith uh, All Body 2 SE is going to be like a 59 Les Paul. So, I mean, think about that. So you have to think about that right there. That's what I would consider is that both guitars are good. I prefer ones to sound better. I, I prefer the sound of, in fact, the EA is a great guitar, but I never really preferred the sound of the acoustic. I don't prefer the sound of most of the transducer type acoustics and electric guitars. For some reason, they really nailed it on the SE. Um, and I say for some reason, but I did an interview with Jack and he explains in that interview why they spent so much time making that thing sound so good. But that's what I would think about is those two guitars is the neck. If you're okay with the chunk of your neck, I would go with the SE. Uh, okay, this one, uh, I thought I saw it last week. So it came up again. And when I see stuff, you guys keep hitting me with each week and I miss it. I try to grab it. Um, I want to say J, J Barb, J Barb, uh, J Barb says, Phil, uh, any advice on a Gibson trapezoid inlay that is starting to pop out on the side? Yeah, so that happens a lot with guitars. Uh, obviously there's a ton of reasons why that can happen. What causes the inlay to lift up? Um, there is a couple ways to handle that. And here is the problem for me. What piece of advice I would give you. That's why I didn't answer your question. It's not that sometimes I don't see your guys' questions or I don't want to answer them. I just can't that question. So I'm going to explain why I can't answer the question. And I'll give you some help figuring out why you have a problem. I need to see the actual thing where it's lifting and how it's lifting to decide how I would approach it. Look, it could be as simple as I stick a razor blade, like an exacto knife in that little, if there's a gap big enough in there and I could literally just work it until I can get, I have a little flat spatula, metal spatula, different ones, uh, for getting the necks off of guitars, you know, cause you heat up the neck on a, on a glued neck 
and then you kind of get your spatula in there and you just kind of spread it apart. I have one little ones for inlay work and stuff and I can get under there. You can get under there too. If you have, you just use a little piece of flat metal and work it out. And then once you work it out, you basically clean out all the old glue and then you just glue it in. Uh, and I just use some type on wood glue and just call it a day. Um, the only thing I would do is after I work it out and clean it, you have to make sure it's as level as possible. And then you may have to actually sand and level it with the fretboard a little bit. Like I say, because you don't want to get into a problem where you have to pull all the frets and level the entire fretboard or worse, pull all the frets and then pull all the inlays and then level the fretboard. If I'm scaring you a little bit, I don't mean to. It's just you have to understand that this, you could make the situation worse a lot easier than you can make it better. And I don't want to scare you because it's actually an easy fix. What I would highly recommend is taking that to a tech. And then if you're not feeling, if you don't feel comfortable with it, um, one thing, uh, that I would also suggest is you, you, I want another reason why I say it's hard for me is because another thing after I just said all that, something I might do if like, if you walked up to me and showed it to me, I might push on it and see if it flexes down. Like if I could push it down, like it, and get it to go flat, like just physically do it with my thumb. What I would probably do is I have some uh, super glue that's very, very thin and I have a syringe and I might try to stick a syringe of just a little bit of super glue in there and then literally clamp it. Uh, and clamp it flat and then let it sit that way and solve your problem right there too. And then it's, you know, it's good. You're golden, right? I don't prefer super glue over uh, wood, uh, wood type glues for stuff. And like I said, you could use a syringe and shoot in uh, wood glue as well to, to do that. But um, for something like this, I would probably just use a super glue because I like the, the uh, I've I had really good luck with the, how well it gets in underneath. Cause I got, I don't know how much of a, cr of a gap underneath the inlay you have. In other words, think of it like a, you could have a poster stamp of material not glued down and you could have a pencil eraser size not glued down. And that's what's great about that super glue is you're shooting it in there and it's gonna get into all those little spaces. And then when I press it down, whatever lifts out, I'll just clean that out real fast because you have to clean it real fast. And unlike the wood glue where you can clean it when you feel like it <laughs> with a damp cloth. See what I'm saying? Those are just two, um, those are just two examples and so, you know, there are examples where I don't use any glue and I don't do anything uh, other than other some other methods. There's a ton of ways to do that. So I wouldn't suggest you do any of the things I just said because I don't know what your situation is. That's one of the downfalls of like a podcast like this. It's not like, you know, we talked about in the past where people sent videos and and pictures and I answered them and that would never be live, but I would do that. So, you know, um, we, we thought about that. That is like a QA, like a, like a more of a, a repair luthier type QA. Literally you guys say, Hey, here's my problem. Look what I see. You know, just take your little, you know, cell phone, show the footage. And then I give it, uh, and I've done that in the past videos like that, but, uh, and then maybe if I have to recreate your problem, I can do that. But like I said, in the, in this way where we're just talking and stuff gets a little tricky when I can't see it and it can go different ways depending on what, how big it is and what's causing it to lift. So, okay. Um, hold on a second. Thought I had, oh, here it is. Okay. This one came from Tony, who's a channel member, says, hey, is there a topic or question that you get asked more than any other also uh with the death of tina turner flying under the radar is it is it is it like turner who was also wait the radar is it oh ike is it ike turner who was also a fantastic blues and soul guitar player um so first let's just talk about the tina turner so we lost tina turner this week which is uh, horrible, a uh, funny, interesting thing, funny, meaning strange, interesting thing was obviously I heard that she passed away. I think it was on Thursday and, uh, and she's 83 and, um, my buddy Ralph said it best and she probably still had amazing legs. Uh, but what was funny about it was, was I went out Thursday and I was out last night. Oh, last night was Thursday. Oh, so she, I think she passed away on Wednesday. So I went out Wednesday and I went out Thursday and both times when we were, when we were out, um, we, they were playing Tina Turner songs. So it's, you know, it's like, it's like she had a, such a huge impact. Um, so 
so anyway, so on the Tina Turner thing, I just want to say, you know, it's a horrible loss, obviously. Um, and uh, I always uh, love Tina Turner. So, you know, um, my I grew up, not only listen to Tina Turner, but I grew up, my mom used to uh, run car clubs in California. <laughs> I don't know what that means. So you guys know, just to give you my age. My mom would explain it to me. It's like, uh, apparently, you know, kids her age used to show off cars. Um, I'm sure it's a thing. It's not something I was interested in. Anyways, I just remember my mom would tell me this story like so many times. Every time a, a Tina Turner song come on, my mom would go, I met Tina Turner. We hired her to play at one of the, the car shows that I that my mom would organize. And so my mom booked her. <laughs> She's like, I booked Tina Turner to play at the car show. So that's my that's my understanding. And of course, being a huge fan of Tina Turner. Um, plus, she was in Thunderdome, which was awesome. Uh, anyways, so what's my point? My point is, yes, it was a horrible loss. I agree with you. And, um, but it's been great, uh, hearing the music blast a couple days after you hear a loss like that. Cause you're like, man, I forgot how awesome Tina Turner music is. Um, so to answer your other question, is there a topic or question that I get asked more than any other? Um, I think the number one question, if I was going to say the number one question I get asked by far is what amp should you use in a bedroom? That seems to be the question that's interesting. And that tells you a lot. Right now, it tells you a lot about guitar playing in general. Um, but also, I think that's really interesting. I once had a conversation with an amp company who made a comment to me. Why do I always say this is what they said? I'm quoting them. Why do you always say and it can get bedroom quiet? They were like, it, it, you know, like, who cares how quiet the amp gets? It's how loud it gets. And I'm like, you're not selling amps to people who are trying to get them loud. <laughs> I go, that's not what's happening. That is not the majority anymore. Um, not even the gigging musicians are trying to get the amps loud anymore. It's not, I mean, not when I say not, I mean the majority, majority rules kind of concept. So anyways, uh, so that point, what's my point? My point is, is that, um, that's the question I get asked a lot, which, cause probably I think it's a, a, con a consideration we all have, especially since a lot of us, if you're like me, you've bought a lot of amps that you thought were going to be great in a bedroom situation, you know, at home. And there just weren't like one of my favorite, my favorite all time amps. I mean, I would put it in my top 10 amps of all time was the Paul Reed Smith MT 15, the Mark Tremonti 15. I love the clean channel. I love the look. I love the cool. I like the blue and the red light thing. I love the gain on that amp. I like the versatility. I love the price point. It's hard. It's super hard to get that thing quiet in a bedroom to where you could play a, a practice. You could practice. And I would find myself always. And I think it's because the potentiometer is linear and not tapered or something's up. But I mean, it jumps. It just goes volume zero to to, to just, ah, oh, just a little too much loud and too loud. And you're always messing with it. And that was my only critique of that amp. And um, for that reason, because I think it's important that you can get an amp to sound good in today's market with modelers and technology and everything we have now and pedals, it's super important that amps can sound great, quiet and loud. And so I understand that question. And that's definitely by far, I think that's the question I get asked the most just when I think of it. I mean, we could probably go into the uh, folders of all the people who send questions and actually know what question gets asked the most. <laughs> but that's my instinct telling you that what I feel like it. Um, yeah, the 11 just said something great. I love it. Uh, Tina did not need auto tune. That is absolutely, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite videos on YouTube is Glenn Fricker's video where he, I think he ran, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody through auto tune and it didn't, it didn't do anything. The auto tune didn't work because there was nothing to auto tune. And, uh, <laughs> I was like, I remember thinking like, this is a magical video. That was actually, I think that video came out before I was even doing YouTube just to give you a reference, or maybe I'd thrown a couple videos on YouTube, but I remember seeing that video and I'm like, and I remember thinking like, I hope I do a video that good one day. Cause I guess that's just a great video. Like I was listening to it and hearing his, what he had to say about that. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, so, and it made you think like, it's kind of like, you know, when you think about great works of art being, you know, written writers writing great works of art, before, you know, the technology we have now where they could be, you know, they can, you know, get all this information to get resource. You think, wow, what did they, what did they do? How did they do a perfect same with Bohemian Rhapsody? Like before they had the technology to make them just sound great. They just had to sound great. Sounds impossible. <laughs> so, uh, all right. 
real quick, I hope you guys give me a second because I saw you guys are talking about the uh, likes and <laughs> it's a funny story. Okay. And uh, I have a, an issue. So I'm going to fix that right now. Go here. Okay. Whoops. Okay. You there? We can see me. Okay. Okay. All right. So what it is, is I wanted to, uh, share the story with you. So I had to download something. I realized we had 500 likes. I was, I didn't think we were going to hit 500 likes. I pulled that. Cause I was like, I don't think we hit that. Okay. So I'm going to share the guitar, my new guitar with you today, but I want to share, if you don't mind, I'd like to indulge you with the story because it's because this guitar is so expensive. I need to explain to you why this matters to me. This isn't like a, Oh, this is an expensive guitar or it's crazy guitar or whatever. So, um, back in 2018, I went to the Paul Reed Smith event. It was the last PRS event they did. Um, and, um, we went and we were invited to go. What happened though? was we got there Friday because they said the event started Friday. Well, we didn't understand because it was my fault. We didn't understand. And I say we, it was uh, a couple of friends of mine, the other YouTube channels too. We didn't understand that I guess the Friday part day was for the dealers only. And then Saturday was for the public. And then that was for the YouTubers as well. So we got there Friday and found out that really we can't see anything because the dealer's there. So we ended up walking around. They let us, Paul Smith, you know, obviously they didn't say get out of here. They just said, hey, go, go ahead and walk around. But, you know, uh, uh, you know, just you know, stay out of the way. So we walked around and the big thing in 2018 was they were coming up with a new model guitar. And, uh, so they showed us the new model guitar and I did a video of this guitar and I've told this story before. I just told the, this part, not the part I just told you. Um, the part I told you was I said, I went to an event once where I did a guitar and I, uh, they said, Hey, this is coming out you know, and you get a first look. So I did a first look. I want to, sh uh, well, I'm not going to show you the guitar yet. So I did a first look on this guitar. The problem was they didn't have any spec sheets for me. So when I did the video, it was kind of a reaction to the video. And then they said, I can't release the video until Monday. And I said, okay. Then on Saturday, what happened was when I got up that morning in the hotel, I went online, every dealer on Friday had their phones and put out the guitars and all the specs and all this stuff. The video I made didn't make any sense because here I am going, yeah, I don't know what the specs are, but look how cool it is. Well, now everybody knew the specs because everything been put on the internet. My video would be look dumb. Like I didn't know what was going on. And uh, so I didn't put out the video. That's not the important part of the story. I'm just telling you what happened. Here's what really happened. I fell in love with the guitar. I've never loved the guitar as much as that guitar. I don't know what it is. It's just everything about it was just right for me. The way it sounds, the way it reacted, the way it felt, everything, the weight, it's crazy. This guitar that I'm about to show you is a uh, minus six pounds, 11 ounces. It's super light. It's like playing air. Um, it's fantastic. It was crazy expensive in 2018, but of course I did what I, <laughs> I do, uh, which is I went to the PRS folks at the event and said, I really love this guitar. I want one. And they go, well, we sold them to the dealers and you can't buy one. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so like, uh, we can, I can buy one from the dealer. So they had dealers and the dealers had bought the guitars and they were selling them to the public. I went to the dealers and basically the dealers have sold them all. There was just nothing to, to really get. And uh, when I say nothing, I should say all the ones I liked. Now I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you the picture uh, of that. Let me go to it. Maybe. Maybe not. Where did it go? Okay, here it is. So this is the picture of me. This is actually, so you guys know, I don't remember the exact uh, price, but I think these speakers that I'm pointing at right here, these are Paul Reed Smith's personal 
like they're his personal studio speakers and they're like some crazy like twenty five thousand dollars a piece or something i could be wrong i just remember they were like oh look at these speakers they're paul's speakers i was like oh look at that smile on my face that's me just like this is the greatest moment ever as i play this guitar now keep in mind it wasn't the color i was in love with the color is great i just love this guitar and uh now here's what happens so 2018 couldn't get the guitar 2019 was the busiest year I ever had in this market. Um, you know, I was traveling a lot, doing stuff, looking for one, trying to get one. And then of course COVID happens. Um, and then they, you couldn't find them. And so I just didn't really, didn't find one. So obviously during COVID, I would look at online, look at the, for this model guitar. Everyone was asking crazy money. In fact, there was one at Rainbow Guitars down in Tucson, Arizona, and it was super expensive. And I was like, this is crazy. And I, I go, I go, I should do it. I should do it. I'm not kidding. It came up on their website. I thought about it. I, it takes me about an hour and 30, hour, 40 minutes to drive to Tucson. I was thinking about driving down and getting it. About an hour goes by, they sold it. I was like, who the heck? It's so crazy. And it's, so, so it's not a super eagle. So let me share it with you. So it's a Paul Reed Smith Simi Hollow Special. This one is, in my opinion, this is so if you don't like it, I understand you don't like it. Everybody's gonna have different tastes. This is to me the most gorgeous PRS I've ever seen my eyes on. And I have Nate, the one Nathan made me. And so is this, I, I don't know how to explain this beautiful gray. It looks like you can see how it's like neon blue, almost like the Know Your Gear logo, right? The Know Your Gear <laughs> neon logo where the blue is outlining this gray. Um, it's got the humbucker narrow filled pickup and then a humbucker five way switch with the dual coil splits volume and tone or volume and tone the back is this beautiful blue that's hard to see in this lighting but you can see the see how it looks like neon on the side where it's blue where they stain the <coughs> where they stain the maple and of course the the rosewood cap and the rosewood fretboard beautiful birds this is not a 10 top okay um this um and like i said it's uh six pounds 11 ounces <laughs> This is not a 10 top. I've explained 10 tops in the past. Like I said, I've done a bunch of the PRS factory tours. They, the way they explain 10 tops to me, the first way I think makes the most sense, which is they get the wood in and people sort the wood, employees sort the wood. And then basically they mark the best pieces. 10 tops are the best pieces get made uh, for private stock. Then I think artist tops, then uh, 10 tops. And then they make the, you know, the regular, the other pieces, the regular production guitars. And what I've learned from that is sometimes the production guitars will look like 10 tops because um, they only mark so many pieces each time. So they might mark a bunch of pieces, 10 top, and uh, and then some other pieces don't get marked 10 top, but they are obviously gorgeous. So <clears throat> please also keep in mind that they, that they mark those in anticipation of what they think they're going to look like after they get the staining and everything. So they don't even know, you know, I mean, not, not 100%. So... Um, so hold on a second more water <laughs> so anyways um that thing is just gorgeous now this is the guitar i was telling you guys about it's got 5708 uh uh low turn pickups somebody was asking about the pickups tci pickups technically all paul reed smith pickups now are tci because it's just his it's a marketing thing tci is a marketing thing when i say marketing thing, i don't mean fake <laughs> please don't tell i'm not telling you it's fake they're putting a marketing name spin on something they're doing, right? They're, so anyways, somebody's like $10,000. It's not $10,000, guys. It's not a private stock. This is not even a 10-top guitar. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's crazy expensive, but it's not. This is not a 10-top crazy PRS. This is not an artist package. This is not a private stock. It's just, look, right? It looks like it's almost amazing. And uh, I should give credit where credit is due. So let me do that real quick. If you don't mind uh and i'm going to be very clear with what i'm saying to you because they i want them to get accolades and not in trouble so what i'm about to say is very important okay um i bought this paul reed smith uh semi hall special from i feel bad the music loft in north carolina in wilmington um, so they're the store I bought this guitar from. I want to be very clear about this, what I'm about to say, because again, 
They were a great store. I had an amazing experience purchasing this guitar from them. Um, and I love, as you guys know, uh, supporting the smaller businesses. Like I said, I could buy something like this from PRS and P or not PRS. Well, yeah, I could probably call PRS and they maybe hook me up with an artist packaging deal or some kind of deal and a price on it. Yeah, I can buy one from Sweetwater for sure at a discount. But like I said, if I can buy from smaller dealers, especially stuff like this, I'd rather buy from them. However, um, what I want to tell you is they did not break any, they did not violate any PRS policies. So they gave me a great deal. Um, they gave me 10% off and then I didn't have to pay sales tax because I bought off their website. And so I didn't have to, so essentially to me, that's 18% off because my sales tax is about 8%. So 18% off for this guitar. So that's what made this guitar like, look, you already heard the story, right? So I want you to understand, not because I'm telling you any reason that I, that, look, you guys are like me and I'm like you and I was, we're guitar fanatics and freaks and there's, you eat, look, I have a lot of nice guitars. I don't need another guitar. And in fact, as you guys know, I have a rule. No guitar comes in unless the guitar goes out. There's actually two guitars going out because of this guitar, possibly three, um, because I got to pay for it. <laughs> so the, one, I got to pay for it. So the guitar's going to go, go Two, um, I don't have the space, but, um, what I was saying was uh, honest to God here, here's the story. I loved it in 2018. I've been thinking about it since 2018. I've been wanting one. This color is like my logo for my channel. It is just gorgeous. Every, the weight is fantastic. And I still, if the, cause they gave me the deal. It's just like, at that point I was like, I go, I did that thing where you do where like, I'm going to see if they'll, they'll make me a deal. And they did not do the deal through advertising. Cause remember, this is important. They don't, uh, you know, dealers are not allowed to advertise a low price by net right now, by telling you, they gave me the lower price. Technically some companies, not Paul Red Smith, but some companies could be jerks and say, oh, that's like advertising. I'm not advertising it. <laughs> I'm not telling you that they're giving you guitars for that price off. I'm just telling you, I asked them for uh, what they could do for me and they took care of me. And so that's what I were allowed to, they're allowed to do. But my point is, is that once they, I asked, because I was like, oh, let's see if they'd say yes. And they, when they said yes, I was like, well, that was all that my obstacles, uh, everything else lined up. So very exciting guitar. I'm glad you guys gave me 500 likes so I could share with you. Um, and like I said, if the chant, if this video, the live show gets 2000 likes, which by the way, most of them kind of do. So I figured I'd do a deep dive on it. It'd be a really cool guitar to see a deep dive. Maybe see, explain why I really think this guitar, if I could, uh, if I could, if I had a lot of times, some people will say, some people say like, tell PRS this. And I'm like, eh, I don't, PRS doesn't want to listen to anything. I got to say the company. So, so, but if I could tell PRS anything, I'm like, please make this an SE. This is an SE. I'd like to see the, the the uh the semi hollow special right i think it's one of my favorite i don't know what it is i don't know why that middle pickup it's those two in between positions do you get the strap positions you get the you get the you know just every tone i pull out of this guitar is just the right tone for me i can play some some metal on it because i play some blues and uh it's just gorgeous i just want to stare at it i just been in fact that's why it's still in the case i've been pulling it out of the case and putting it back in the case i never do that i'm just like expensive um, plus I don't want to damage it or nick it until I get rid of the other guitars because <laughs> it, it'll get nicked or something. Something always happens. So they downfall of guitars. You buy a nice guitar, something's going to happen to it. It's like, it's like buying a nice car, right? Shopping carts are looking for nice cars. Things are looking <laughs> corners of tables and, and, be and benches are always looking for nice guitars. Um, so there you go. Thank you. Uh, that was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, so <laughs> blue guitars as uh, l says blue guitars are indeed factually better lol yeah you know it's funny i just was looking at it i just love the gray but when i paid attention saw the blue outline i was like oh it's like neon blue i'm like oh like the new year gear logo is a neon blue outline i'm like ah that's too many signs to get it all right so now we shared the beautiful guitar and uh i know some of you uh let's see if you guys asked i don't think you know i was waiting to see if you guys asked some of you guys were like what guitars are you gonna get rid of i haven't decided yet um that's what i do next i'll be deciding like they'll be like i said that's why i said it could be two or three because i have to figure out how to get i get to i actually have to take one for one whenever i get a guitar but it's expensive guitars like this i i like to just kind of figure out how to get that much money i spent in guitars sold out and just keep it that way i try not to at this point i've said this before um, I, one of the nice things about collecting collectors, period, just whatever you collect is you get to a certain point where you really don't spend money anymore. You kind of just churn it right as you refine a collection and that's what happens. And so guitars like this become more obtainable 
because you have a couple of th- pieces that you can go, okay, yeah, I can get rid of those pieces. You know, kind of like I was telling you about the trade, right? This is the trade up, trading a couple pieces for a one nice piece. So, and I was also nervous about this guitar because the whole time it was on its way, I was like, maybe I, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I dreamed that it was that great. You know, like in other words, you know, you play something years ago and then you get it and you go, I don't remember it being this sucky. <laughs> so I was like, is it great? I remember, I remember being great. I remember having a full sound to it and then also having a stratty kind of sound. So, so there you go. Um, let's see. Okay. So, all right, let's get on to the next, uh, next thing. <laughs> uh, Gene says, get rid of the Esteban guitar. I don't have it. I know what you mean. Yeah. The old Esteban guitars. He, you know, I don't know if you know this. A lot of you guys, uh, you know, some of you guys know the Esteban guitars, right? That was on infomercials. Remember Esteban, the amazing classical player, uh, who was selling his guitars, those, the really junky Esteban guitars. He's, uh, from, oh, I don't know if he's from here, Arizona, but he, I remember, you know, what I remember about Esteban guitars was the first time I, I saw him play at the mall. He played at, um, I want to say the Tempe mall. I can't remember what mall is Mills mall. And so he was playing at the Mills mall, I think in the courtyard one day. And I saw him and I go, man, that guy's really good. I remember thinking that. And, uh, I mean, he's, cause he was an amazing player Esteban. And then, uh, somebody, I think somebody was with me said, oh yeah, he's local. He plays here in town. You can go see him anytime. And I go, oh, that's great. And then I don't remember very long after that, all of a sudden I saw him on QVC selling Esteban guitars. And I was like, oh, and, uh, I've worked on a couple Esteban guitars. They are, uh, they're tough, man. They're a rough guitar, man. They, they had some the uh, bad QC issues for sure. So, oh man, this is crazy. Okay. Um, what are we doing? <laughs> See, I share a guitar with you guys and I'm all guitar. Uh, so, okay, let's, uh, okay. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go into the, uh, go back to questions. That's going to be important. I'm sure at some point. Uh, okay. So we have a question. It's from Steel Rude. Great sign on. It says, Hey, Phil, switched from guitarist to bass player. This is bassist, but I know what he means. Uh, it says, uh, why, why is it so hard to find a nice looking practice amp? I had a Princeton that looked good in my living room. Hard to find something similar in bass. You know, I, again, you know, look, we might ha- not have the same, uh, you know, likes, but, uh, when I think of a good looking bass amp, uh, it, it's actually really inexpensive. My favorite, again, if, especially if you like the Princeton, you know, I'm a Princeton fan. Uh, let's, uh, let's look, I'm going to share with you right here. Uh, let me find a good practice amp. Here's one for $189. Oh, it's a one eight. You know what? That's a great one. Uh, and I actually had this one. So let me show you. So this one is the, the Ampeg rocket base. This is the one eight. You can get the one ten. This is one eighty nine, right? But so, you know, they're a lot louder than you think you are. I mean, for practice, this one eight will, will thump. Um, you get a treble mid range bass control and a volume. There you go. You know what? I think I was wrong. I think I had the 10, the one ten. Uh, so it's got the black diamond like Tolex on it. How much is the 110? I bet you it's not much more at all. There you go. 110, 279. So less than a hundred dollars more. Nine, 279. Look at this. It's, I think they're gorgeous, especially. So it's not the blue diamond that you kind of remember from the sixties, you know, era of the sixties, seventies looking base amps, the amp pegs. Um, but the black, that's the back. I don't know why I keep showing you the back of the amp. There's the front. I think it's good looking. It's got the big Chrome Ampeg logo. They sound great. These are like the Fender Rumbles, man, punching way above their weight, you know, just sounding great. Um, this one has uh, actually some cool features too. Let me go back to it. Um, Cause like I said, it has treble mid-range bass volume. And then of course it has like this overdrive channel. I'm not a big overdrive bass channel, you know, cause even, you know, but it's got a cool grit level overdrive. It's got the negative uh, 15 dB, the zero dB. So that's a cool amp. And that's pretty inexpensive. And I think if you, if you like that, then there's a lot of their other amps like that too. You want to spend a lot of money and the Princeton you had, was probably close to a thousand dollars. You could probably get for a thousand bucks. 
Well, think of this. If you like the Princeton, the Fender Rumbles look almost like the Princeton. I mean, they're not the same, right? But um, Ampeg has a few other base amps that are in the closer to $1,000 that are a little more classic looking, if you like the classic look, right? Um, like I said, the Fender Rumble, let's just show it to you. The Fender Rumble series. The Rumble 40, is that what I had? Yep. Fender Rumble. I get it. It's it's it doesn't have the layout in the front, so it just looks like a speaker box. It's kind of like the other one too, the base amp. But this looks like your Fender amp, right? And it's got a cool look to it, you know, on the top. Sounds great. Um, if I was gonna say which one sounded better, I've owned both. I I kind of remember the Fender Rumble Rumble sounding just a little bit better than the Ampeg, but I never A B'd them, and I don't know. But I can tell you this. I kind of, like I said, I kind of remember out of the two, if I was like, oh, maybe the Rumble's a little better. And of course it looks like the Rumble's just a little cheaper too, which is nice. Um, but I remember just loving the way the Ampeg sound too. So there was no downside, but those are pretty good looking amps. You know, if you like the Princeton, again, everybody's got different tastes, but based on what you said you liked, I'm thinking those are in that realm and those are more modern. That's if you don't go old school and go some older amps and stuff. So I would suggest something like that and they sound great and they have headphone jacks. So something your Princeton didn't even have. Okay. Um, hold on. Okay. So, uh, by the way, Vim69, thank you so much. He said, just cause he did a super chat. Um, so, uh, Guitar Nuts Anonymous says, hey, going broke, keeping my YouTube channel afloat. Any tips? Um, no, you are not going to make money on YouTube as, as, at, look, you, doing YouTube videos is no different than having a, a band. The odds of you being doing it to be self-sufficient are not in your favor, okay? And I know that I'm supposed to say, and again, I don't see myself as a successful YouTuber. I see myself as like a, like I, my joke to my kids is I'm a, I'm a D-level YouTuber, D-level, D, like when they say D-level D celebrity, right? Like I'm a D-level YouTuber, right? So I'm not, uh, but... Here's what I mean by that. You know, like I said, you know, it's kind of like, I get it that there's like a couple hundred thousand subs here and you get some big views and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, make light of what it, it's been achieved here on the channel. But um, I also, I, I kind of at my heart want to say like, you can do it. And if you put in the work, you'll do it. And uh, no, how I feel uh, where I'm at now is it's been an insane amount of work with a crap ton of luck. And that's how far I, this is how, and that's where I am now, right? Like in other words, like, I feel like I would love to tell you that, hey, look, I just was out there and I was just doing it every day. No, I feel like it was an insane amount of work and just an, a massively insane amount of luck to get where, to even where I pulled some views or pulled some uh, some things. You, you literally have to be ready at all times if you have a video. Um, what I can tell you though, um, is this, I'm not trying to discourage you from doing this, by the way, what I'm challenging you to tell you is you better have some very realistic expectations of what you want to get out of this. And the first thing has to be, um, your enjoyment. Like as I, uh, my best advice I ever gave was on a Sweetwater asked me to give some advice on being a YouTube channel. And one of the things I said was make sure that you do what you like, because my experience, not only here on this channel, but also with the hundreds of other channels that I've interacted with in a friendly way, in other words, a little bit more on the back end talking, um, is that a lot of channels uh, end up in the same kind of uh, problem, which is the video that you don't like making becomes the video that everybody wants to watch. Um, there are a lot of channels, you know, I think if I was given, and I don't know what kind of channel you are, so I'll check out your channel, but um, a lot of channels that are not gear review channels, they're in hell right now because there are a lot of channels that they're like, I wanted to teach music or I wanted to write, you know, I want to do these entertainment videos and I just did some reviews and that's all people will watch. And I hate that. And I'm like, yeah. And that's why you're screwed because I love it. And cause I love it. You have to fight somebody like me who can't wait to buy another guitar, even though Pete company send them guitars and I have guitars. Like I just can't stop thinking about this. So yeah, you're in hell because you have to fight that. So my my experience of YouTube so far is, man, please try to figure out to do something you love because you're going to have to do it all the time. YouTube is not very forgiving. They don't care how many subscribers you have. You know, my last video was a flop. Uh, so, you know, this week's video was a flop. It happens. 
<laughs> you know, it was the Orangewood video and it just didn't do well. Um, it, it, it's, uh, according to YouTube, not only did YouTube send me a message saying that it didn't do well, I already know my next video has got a big hit, a big wh uh, problem. Uh, it's going to hit a big wave because of the fact that it's not going to send YouTube's not going to send notifications to most of my viewers that the next video came out because you guys engaged so little with the last one. YouTube's like, yeah, maybe they're sick of him. <laughs> it happens all the time. That's why you see these channels up and down. It just takes one bad video to crap your channel out. So, um, so, uh, like I said, do what you love, try to get that out of it. And then also, like I said, this is the important part. Try to figure out what you need out of this because this is important too. So many people focus on views. So many people focus on the money aspect. So many people focus on the relationships. I know there's a lot of, look, I'm the last guy to ask for this stuff, but I know there's a lot of like the fame of it. I mean, uh, you know, if you were to ask me, like, what's the two things I hate doing most? Look, you, my family can't even get me to take a picture. <laughs> okay. I don't, I spend all this time on camera for these videos, which is weird considering I don't like taking photos and I don't like being in videos. So it's a weird thing. Um, one of the things that's tough for me is I really like gear. And for some reason, I like interacting with you guys about gear. And this is the medium that, that, that was presented to me to do so. And I did it, but I'll tell you right now, one of the things that I, I find when I hang out with other channels, they have problems with is, um, like Dobie Doss, when we hung out, you know, his, his instinct, cause he's got the right instinct is let's make some content. And my instinct when I'm hanging out with other channels is I don't want to do that. Cause that's what I do like all week and I don't want to do any more of it. So, um, Carl, by the way, thank you. He says, but that was a great video. Um, so you guys know the people who watch that video, the interaction is actually really, really high. In other words, more people are watching more of it than normal videos. So the interaction's high. It's just people don't like the title and the thumbnail or whatever it is that's not interacting. They're just not doing it, but that's fine. I like the video. I'm not complaining. It just sounds like I'm complaining. I'm just explaining because he asked the question about his YouTube channel, what you have to deal with. So like I said, I think that's the biggest thing, a piece of advice I can give you is uh, do uh, figure out what you, you like to do and do that over and over again. Not because I'm saying you're going to be successful at it. Okay. I wish I could say that something so easy as that. Like, Hey, if you do what you love, man, it'll, it'll happen. What I'm saying is, do what you love because you have to do it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Everybody's going to have a different opinion of what a lot is, um, but you will be doing it a lot. <laughs> That's, that is the, the world of the social media platform is you need to make a lot of stuff. Um, so there you go. And, uh, and then uh, the other piece of advice, it's not my advice, but I'll give it to you. Um, I heard this great advice uh, that was given to on uh, Mr. Beast, the huge channel, Mr. Beast. He said, replace the word algorithm with audience. And I thought, oh, that's the best advice I've ever heard. So in other words, don't focus on the algorithm, focus on the audience. That's why when I say you guys didn't like that video, don't notice I'm not complaining about <laughs> anything else. I'm just saying you guys didn't like it. So that's what I focus on is like, how do I, you know, how do I engage with the audience as much as I can? And, um, you know, with what they like, not what they watch. So in other words, it's not, I'm not, so you get the idea. I hope that helps. Um, but on the other thing about going broke, I don't know, man, that's the biggest problem I have. I mean, I just redid all my cameras and it was, and it's, I mean, think about this just to, to, to give you, and then I'll get off this. Cause I always, I always feel like if you guys want to do YouTube questions, I always feel like maybe we should do an extra podcast a month or every once in a while, every once a quarter and on specific on YouTube. Cause a lot of people find the YouTube stuff boring and not the gear, but I just want to say this. So you guys have a reference of it for gear channels. Here I am talking about this guitar and how expensive it is and how crazy it is. I just bought cameras that cost twice this. I just bought, I mean, I bought, no, sorry, just the cameras. I just bought gear to make videos that, that make this seem cheap. That's kind of why also sometimes you go, God, I spent so much money on the stuff to make the videos. Can I just get <laughs> a new, I want that guitar, damn it. So you guys see the guitars and you see that flash of it, but the money you're spending on your YouTube channel is not this stuff. It's always the stuff in front of the, you know, in front, what I'm seeing, it, it's a lot of money. It's nuts. Um, and then, uh, cause I said that I should also uh, say this, this is important. This is, uh, uh, I think this is important. Um, I had a hundred thousand subscribers. I, I, I I'm, I'm okay now with telling these stories. So some stories I just didn't like telling in the past. I was embarrassed from, about them. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to do. So let me tell you my story that will help you with your YouTube channel. I didn't, own, uh, I, when I started making YouTube videos, like I, I said, my, my, my buddy, Matt was, 
ask me to do some videos. I basically did them. I put them on YouTube. I did it with my phone. I think it was a Galaxy 8, I want to say. Uh, uh, Droid phone, Galaxy 8, or whatever. It's Galaxy 8, Samsung. And, um, and then I did a bunch of videos with my Galaxy 8. How I would do the videos is I would have to do the videos about 8 o'clock in the morning because that's when the sun came through the window in my bedroom and it lit up the room the most towards me. And I could make the videos. If you look at my old videos, you'll see one where it's kind of really dark. And it was dark because... Um, I did one in the afternoon. I learned that the sun is in the wrong side of the window. So I basically just did them in the morning with my Galaxy phone. Shortly thereafter, I updated and I got some interface to plug guitar microphones and microphones into this interface, including a little lapel mic that I got off Amazon that clipped my shirt. I did those videos until I had 120,000 subscribers. Then I got invited to GitCon. No, GitCon? Yeah, GitCon. Henning invited me to GitCon. When I went there uh, to hang out with all the YouTubers and do videos, I was embarrassed to show them that I was just making my videos on my phone. So I went and bought a camera because I didn't own one. I didn't, and I bought a laptop. And I got the software to make videos. And on the flight to Germany, I thought I would teach myself how to use this stuff. And I basically couldn't figure it out that well. And so when I got to GitCon, what I did was I pretended that I was using my cameras <laughs> and what I had, it was a tripod with my phone. If you watch all the GitCon videos I did, those were all done with my phone as well. Um, in fact, even they gave me files and some of the files I didn't use, I just used the phone I had um, because I didn't know how to use that stuff. And I thought that was probably embarrassing because I was like, oh, I have 100,000 subscribers, I should know how to do this. And now I'm tenured and, and experienced enough to know that I'm a guitar channel. I'm a guitar guy. I can fix guitars. I can teach you about guitars. I can share my experience with guitars. I can share my love of guitars. That has nothing to do with directing, editing. I've had to learn it all, editing, all that stuff. I did it all on an app. So keep in mind, 100,000 subscribers, doing it all on my phone with a $299 app. If I had my, I have my phone in the other room, I'd tell you what the app is, but it's $2.99. I did all that that way. And that's how I did that forever. And then slowly I just taught myself this stuff. So, you know, <clears throat> This is how an experience I am. There's a video I did on basses. I forget the name of the video, but just it's a bass video and it's from a few years ago. In that video, if you watch the video, no one said anything. God bless you all for that. Uh, in the video, it's like lit like this. And if you watch it, by the end of the video, I'm almost like in the dark. It's because I finally bought some real lights. Somebody's like, buy lights. I'm like, where? And they go, Amazon. I bought them on thing and it had batteries. And um, I didn't know how long they lasted. And during the video, I didn't realize that the lights were just dimming as I was filming. So I've, I've kind of gone through all this stuff. So basically what, um, what I will tell you is this with your channel, uh, on the note of, like I said, everything I said, I think is good advice. Do what you like to do and do it a lot. Also on the cost, don't, I just told you I spend a lot of cost now. Well, I spend the cost now because I have a patron base that pays for it. I, I built a community. This community supports this channel. That's how this channel operates like this. But it would never work, in my opinion, backwards. I, I think if I spent all this the money um, and there wasn't the community there. So uh, that's my advice. Uh, we'll get back to guitar stuff now. And then, like I said, I'll check out Guitar Nuts Anonymous. Okay. Warren Five says, new guitar day, Gretsch. 5655 TG in black gold mist. Must. It says must, but I think it's mist. Gives a penguin vibe. Any thoughts on the reissued DOD pedals? That was out of, that went out of nowhere. Right? <laughs> I thought it was going to be one thing. And you're just like, that's one thing. Let's talk about DOD pedals. Uh, it says might get a 280 comp. Yeah, the DOD pedals back. I've talked about this. DOD did checks back. Uh, obviously, um, uh, Cortec bought the company, revived it. Um, Look, I'm hoping. I just saw that they just bought, brought back the Dream Team from Digitech and DoD. All the old creators are back. You can check it out on Guitar World. There's a whole thing. I'm super excited. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of Cortec guitars. Um, I've been a huge uh, fan of Samic, Cortec. You know, like I said, I, I, I like really understand. You guys understand all these brands that we think we like. A lot of them are just really good factories, and those brands buy from those factories and have us manufacture good guitars. And so there is a lot to say about the brand and the specs that they spec out. There is, but there's also something about the quality of the manufacturing behind it too. And so I really think with Cortec, um, especially looking at some of the amps, like they made the new Archon and I think it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's made in Indonesia from Cortec and that's a great amp. 
and at a price point that I think it's very, very reasonable. Um, in fact, in my opinion, the new Archon is more reasonably priced than the MT-15. The MT-15, I think, is $700 made in China, and the uh, Archon is a uh, is a 50 watt amp, uh, two channel made in Indonesia by Cortec, Cortec, and it's a thousand dollars. So basically, a couple hundred dollars more, and a lot more going on with the amp, and of course, you know, having a wood box with vinyl and stuff, a lot more expense to it. So really cool stuff. I think I'm really excited about DOD. I'm just really hoping. So you know, they're going to keep making announcements. I keep hearing them. All I really care about is please make me a mini Digitech pedal. I just the Digitech whammy. I love the whammy pedal. I just never could understand why I can't devote. I don't use big pedal boards. I use a small pedal board, so I cannot devote, you know, a book, you know, a Reader's Digest size pedal, <laughs> book size pedal on my board. So I would love a Digitech Whammy pedal that's really small. And I know some of you are going to go like, you know, talk about the other pedals. I'm talking about with the expression pedal. So <clears throat> Jeff says, hey, how good are the Fender CC60S Concert Pack V2 All Mahogany with Gig Bag? I don't know. You know, uh, the CC60, CD60s, all those Fender guitars were our bread and butter at our shop for years. We would sell those very affordable guitars that sounded really good. Um, they used to come with cases. <laughs> I know this. They used to come with cases, so they come with gig bags now. Um, they're probably really good. I'd have to see, like I said, I, first, I haven't touched one, you know, um, so that I can't tell you. Um, but without touching one, I need to, if I knew what factory is coming out of it, I can tell you what factories are making really good, affordable acoustics. Obviously when I just reviewed that Orangewood, that's one of the things I like about Orangewood is, um, Orangewood is, is exactly what you think they are. So, you know, they're a, a company that put a brand and then they're having those guitars OEM by somebody else. Well, you got to understand in this industry, the back, the, the behind the scenes about Orangewood, what you don't know is, is the people behind Orangewood really do make they do a lot of work um for other companies in other words they're they make a lot of guitars they have a lot of guitars made and they handle them they do the you know the the marketing and sales and stuff so these guys are in the industry and they kind of know how to get a good guitar at a low price and they figured it out and so what i mean by that is same you understand the logic they're just looking around they're promoting guitars you know doing guitars for other companies and they're like yeah we could do this we know those factories we have good relationships with those factories let's get those factories to make us really great guitars we'll brand them and get them on social media and then work on and what they're doing is they're doing three things it's a three-prong attack with orangewood essentially have a great factory build the guitar okay then make sure that it's all set up and done well before it ships out in, in, in California and then get social media guys to, to talk about them. Uh, because again, the, it's, it's insane. It's insane. Um, what, uh, the cost equation is. In other words, in other words uh, the, the difference between having another middleman, which is a store, and then those guitars would have to be, um, you know, a two, three, four hundred dollars more. The guitar I reviewed this week, that guitar, if you ask me, in my opinion, not the guitar that it sits at street price, two ninety five, but I think they run coupons all the time. If you buy that guitar with a coupon price, that's pretty much what I think a a, a company like Paul Reed Smith would pay for a guitar like that uh, if they were buying them. So they're buying them for you know you're getting a really good deal for the for the specs. That's why the specs are so good. They're just trying to create their um <laughs> smart. It's, it's funny. Smart Manimal says Orangewood needs to make their finishes a little thinner. The problem with that is, see, like that, let me explain that to you, okay? So uh, this is something here. Let's not talk about Orangewood. That has nothing to do with them. They're not specking the thickness of their finish. Um, most likely not, okay? Um, the finishes, the way guitars are made has has a purpose. The You know, not all guitars. Some guitars are just made for no damn reason. In other words, you know, they just make them. Um, most guitar companies, you gotta understand, like the Fender CD60s, the Fender S guitars in that price range will have the same kind of thickness and finish, okay? So let me explain what I mean by that. You do not make guitars in the price range of 150 to let's say $500. You do not want those guitars to be similarly, similarly, slurry. You don't want them to be specced out like expensive acoustics. Okay. It's not like electric guitars. It's a much different animal. Okay. So let me put it this way. Uh, a Taylor expensive, you know, a $3,000 Taylor and let's say that $295 Orangewood, you could argue all day how, how long, how I'll argue all day long, how good they are compared to each other. But really what I want you to focus on is this. Um, 
there is a lot more maintenance that comes in a high-end acoustic, right? You definitely need to make sure you're humidifying it. You definitely need to make sure that sometimes you're putting them in cases and keeping them in cases. There's a lot of work that goes with a high-end acoustic. It's a very, just think of it like a Stradivarius violin. The more that the more delicate that guitar, the more you have to be delicate with that guitar. And the reality is, is a lot of guitar players, especially hobbyist guitar players, especially beginner guitar players, they're not very delicate with their guitars. They're using them for a lot of purposes. So the other thing about a thicker finish is that it skin stops the guitar from feeding back a lot when they're playing little sets and they don't, you know, so there's a ton of reasons why you wouldn't want the finish thin. It has nothing to do with orange wood. Keep in mind, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> Just, I care about the, the, Logic of the guitar. And here's why. And again, I want to give you my perspective. There's always going to be a perspective out there and, and nobody's wrong. I just need to explain why my perspective is the way it is. So somebody will say like, oh, they shouldn't put a finish on a guitar or they should use a thin nitro finish on the guitar or they should use this kind of bracing or they should do it this kind of way. And, uh, or they should all use full solid. These are all good uh, critiques. However, you don't look at a tool and say, oh, it should be the best titanium steel ever because that's what the best tools have. You should go, okay, this tool has has a job. What's its job and how do you achieve that job? A guitar for basically $200 to $300 has a job. The job is to be that price point. First, that's huge because it gets people into that guitar. Secondly, to be durable. Notice I talked about in that video how durable it was. I made a whole speech at the end of that video, if you watch that video, about why I think it's important to have a durable guitar like that. I mentioned about taking it to a friend's house and in case it got knocked over. In fact, I hit that guitar on the corner on, on purpose. I hit that guitar on the corner of, of, my, of my new desk because it was different. And I thought I nicked it. It was after the video. So I was like, ah, it's after the video. And I go, oh, it's fine. You know, no, 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 Nick. If I hit my tailor, I might've damaged it. Cause it's again, different finish, different rules. So again, you want it to be, you want it to sound great, but you need it to have a certain purpose too. You know what I mean? A little bit more durable. So acoustics have a lot of reasons for being the way they are. Smaller acoustics, bigger acoustics for the way that they sound and do things. Um, so I understand what you're saying, but just understand that I, if they made the finish, if they made the finish thinner, my guess is they'd sell less guitars overall over time. So, because somebody would say, you would probably notice the guitar is just a little louder, but that's not the only thing people are after. In fact, I think a lot of times with guitars like that, being loud, isn't really super important. It's just having a good guitar that plays great and take some abuse. <laughs> Again, abuse is the key. I've sold a lot of acoustic guitars to a lot of people at different price points. And I can tell you when you hit the lower price points, how well you can travel, how well you can use a guitar, how, you know, think about this. Um, when you sell hundred, this is something to think about that's important. When you sell hundred dollar acoustics to people, you understand almost none of them will buy a guitar stand. So almost all those guitars just get leaned against the wall or a bed or a nightstand. So. Could you imagine if they made the guitar to where, you know, where it wouldn't do well if it wasn't a stand? No one's going to buy a stand. I remember time after time, anybody who's worked at a guitar center or a music store will tell you this. Like, hey, okay, you're going to take that $99 guitar? Yeah. Would you like a stand for $14.99? $14.99? That's insane. I'm not paying that. <laughs> so much less. I'm trying to get them to buy an extra pack of strings. I think I told this story. My favorite my favorite thing at the sh uh, re repairing guitars uh, ever is the it was always moms i don't mean to pick on moms there was always moms though there was always moms that would come in the shop they always bought guitars on amazon the guitars were always really inexpensive like 59 dollars guitars 79 dollars guitars they would come in and they would uh have a problem with the guitar like a broken string something easy like that or and they go oh i i need i need some strings and we go yeah yeah they're 7.99 they go 7.99 i only paid 45 dollars for this guitar they would freak out so badly. We were always like, I know, I know. Cause in my head, I was like thinking, what, what are you crazy? They've been 799 since like 92. But in my head, I was like, yeah, think of it from their perspective. It's $10 in strings for a guitar. It costs 45 bucks. But I remember every time I just remember like cringing. Cause as I knew, as soon as I said the price of strings were going to flip out. Kind of like when they bought hundred dollar guitars and you tell them it's $80 to do a setup, <laughs> they would freak out. <laughs> yeah, see, eighty dollars guitar, sixty dollars setup. Sounds right. Um. Okay, so let's go back to questions. I'm gonna all over the. I feel like I'm all over the place today. Um, Gear Sounds says, "Hey Phil, I just did a video on the Benson 
Echo Rec remake by T-Rex. I see the newer pedals perform better on YouTube, but I can only afford to buy so many per month. Should I contact companies? I'm the last guy to ask that. My relationship companies are almost nil. I have more companies that won't work with me than it will by 10 to one. I'm not exaggerating. So um, that's where I can't help you. You know, you perceive, people perceive because of my channel. Um, the way I follow the rules is this. If a company gives me a guitar, sends me a guitar, loans me a guitar, I buy the guitar, but I know somebody who works at that company and I have a relationship with them. Um, I A friend loans me that guitar. I just mark the guitar as provided, product provided. So that's what product provided means in being in my videos. It could mean that they gave me the guitar. Could mean they loaned it to me. Could mean that a friend paid for or bought it and then loaned it to me. Could mean that I just know somebody at that company. So the reality is this. Um, I the reason I say I'm horrible at this. I just I'm. I mean I don't have that advice for you. I can tell you the the I can name the list of companies that I work with. It's very short. The biggest company I work with is Sweetwater, and that's because of you guys. That has nothing to do with me. Um, you, I put affiliate links from them. You guys buy a lot of stuff. They see that the channel sells a lot of stuff. So they reach out and send me stuff to do on the videos. Um, and that's my relationship that works with them. But like the main companies, I don't get a whole lot of stuff. It just kind of seems that way, but it's not that way. Um, so, uh, on your, to answer your question, um, I don't know. I don't know what you should do. That's why I'm always like, I, 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 I can tell you. I would find the channels that are doing videos like these sponsored videos just constantly. I see them all the time. I see channels doing a sponsored video like every day. They do them every day. There's there's dozens and dozens and dozens of channels. They're doing 300 videos a year, all sponsored. I would reach out to them and see if there's something that can give you some advice. Um, I used to reach out to them for advice too as well, and they were really helpful with me. But what I really I realized is, look, you're not going to go far in this uh, community uh, with companies if you're... Um, if you do what I do. So don't do what I do. <laughs> I'm laughing. By the way, this question is badly timed. I've had a tough week this week with companies. Uh, I've had more companies screw with me this week than uh, like it's, it just happens sometimes. It's not, it's not a bad thing. Um, it's not a bad thing. So uh, let's see. Brian says, hey, Phil, any recommendations on a push pool pot? that has a built-in boost circuit. Um, the only one I found so far is made by uh, Beckos FX and it's sold out. Um, no, I don't really know. I'm not really a big fan. I don't really use like those boost circuits. So, you know, um, you know, Jackson had one back in the day that was really, really popular. There's a guy on YouTube, no, uh, eBay, <coughs> who makes a clone of that Jackson circuit that's uh, boost. Signal boost. Um, I'm just not really familiar with those. I've in installed a few over the years, and usually they're always provided to me by the customer. The customer would have them, and they, I just install them. So, uh, if your question was how to wire them in, and that I got you all day, but like, what would I recommend? I don't know. Oh, I love boost pedals. I use them like crazy, but I didn't generally don't put the boost in my guitars. And so, I was gonna say the only guitar I think I have with boost in it is the uh, is the uh, Petrucci guitar. And um, I don't use the boost on it. It sounds great, but I don't use it. So it does like a little cool thing, but I don't need it. Uh, David says, hey, I still don't have a question. <laughs> this is just what I always do. You know what? That's great. It's perfectly time for me. Maybe my brain needed a second to <laughs> process. So you gave it to me. Uh, Tone Strap says, hey, thanks for your service. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, hey, uh, honoring those who sacrificed all and, and the loved ones they left behind. And again, that's what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about Memorial Day and Memorial Day weekend. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always a, you know, it's tough, man. It's a tough thing to think about. Like, yeah. One of the things, oh man, I don't want to talk about this, but I need to take a second to drink water. So my dad's buried at a veteran's uh, cemetery. And, uh, when they buried my father, um, we would go visit him from time to time. 
and it was uh it was tough because when you go there every time if you've been to like the oh cemeteries in general but just veterans cemetery you go to your row you know you go where he is and then there's you know they're empty there's none you know to the like to hit where him i think it's to the right of him there's none so every time you go there's more you know more um i say they're not tombstones they're like plates you know plaques on the ground and you would walk and i remember every time that's why actually so you know i i I didn't visit i don't visit my father's grave as much uh anymore um because of this reason it was just too upsetting every time uh it was like we would walk and every time we would walk you'd see new uh placards you know whatever on the ground and it was always young kids because you know it was the iraq war afghanistan war all that stuff and you're just like you know and it's tough when you walk by and i know this is i know this is off topic guys i know this is a bummer it's just i'm just you know hey um it's uh it's one of those things when it's tough to walk by somebody's uh gravestone essentially and see you know you you know you i do what everybody does you see the name you see the rank and then you see the start and end date you know right like you know you know and uh the day they were born the day that they they died and you look and of course you know, you're looking at your date. That's the first thing most people do. You go, you know, you know, if you're born in 60, you're like, they're born in 70. If you're born in 70, they're born in 80 and so on and so on and so on. So it's tough when you see that and you go, wow, you know, that's like, they're already, they're already gone. They were just here for a minute. And so I, like I said, there's, these are one of those subjects that it's like tough for me to not talk about. Cause again, it's a tough thing. And that's why, like I said, um, you know, we do our best to honor them and Give them a few minutes of our time on the show. I guess it's the least we can do for them. Uh, Brian says, hey, Phil, I love your weekly podcast. I've been trying to find a link to buy a set of your pickups. Are you still making them possible? A link, please. So that was a question that actually came in earlier. It was an early riser question too about the update on the Black Sock pickups. Uh, the thing on the Black Sock pickups, if you notice, I don't mention them very often. is because if I don't have any in stock, I don't mention them. It's, um, one of the things that's nice about them is that when I mention them, we sell out. Interesting enough, what you may not know is that I did a review of a guitar. It was kind of a funny story. I did a review of a guitar a couple uh, months ago or a couple weeks ago. It was the Squire, the 40th anniversary. And originally in the video, I'm going to call it, I call it the treatment, right? The treatment is like the story of the video, right? So when I do a, a deep dive video, there's actually a, like a logic to it. You know, like this is going to be, you know, like I go through the guitar and I think, okay, this is what we'll cover on it. And this is going to be the tech tip. And this is going to be the stuff. And I just kind of, like I said, bullet point everything I do. And then uh, I mentioned in that video, if you know, I upgraded the, the lock to the locking keys. Um, the guitar actually is up. The guy, Rob, uh, Rob, who's, who's a patron who bought that guitar and let us use it on the channel. Um, we actually did more to the guitar than what he saw in the video. He was very pleasantly surprised, by the way, <laughs> when he got the guitar. Uh, thank you again, Rob, for letting us do that. Um, we set, we put a set of black stock pickups in the guitar and, um, we didn't put that in the video and it was because, uh, when we did it, I was going to have time. Something came up. I don't have any time. That's my biggest problem right now. I'm dealing with a bunch of stuff. Of course, as you guys know, the black, uh, the badlands launch is, uh, of the, of the fulfillment of the red lines are about to happen and I'm on that. And so there's just, it's just, there's only so much, man. There's like, I got to make the videos. There's a video come out. So YouTube doesn't freak out. Uh, my daughter graduated this week. You know, this is how it goes. And uh, I love making the pickups, but you can imagine, like, you got to you gotta prioritize your days and how you go. Um, and then Grumpy Mike's like, will you ever make P90s again? What's going to happen with pickups? So I guess that's better. Let's, let's, let's talk about the positives. Here's the positives. What's going to happen is uh, I'm going to make runs of pickups again. And that's, I think, how I'm going to do it. I'm, we're, we've decided, we've talked about this. We're not going to make all the pickups available anymore. So there won't be, you won't be able to go to the website of Black Sock and, and see humbuckers, single coils, P90s and stuff. It'll just be like, I will do a hundred humbuckers and then we'll sell them out. You know, we'll, we'll release them. As soon as I usually release them, they sell. That's why, like I said, uh, the same with the P90s, same with the single coils. I, I've created a little loyal following of the pickups and it's been really pretty, pretty good. Um, so pretty cool. So that's the kind of plan on that. And then we'll figure out. Um, we talked about, like I said, doing a limited run of some affordable Humbuckers, that's still on this uh, on the table, so that's still in in the works, I should say. Um, so they, I just have an approved prototype because I'm still not still not 100 happy yet. Okay. Um, 
What else? Uh, Joseph says, hey, Phil, which pickups would you recommend for a baritone guitar to maximize clarity and articulation with full chords and picking notes? You know, I'm not a huge baritone player, as I've said in the past, but I will say this. I'm a huge seven string fan and I like seven strings. I like uh, uh, PAF style pickups for, for baritones or seven strings. Um, I really like Fishman stuff for that stuff. Same with the EMGs. I like, there's something about, think of it this way. I think when you get into the baritone pickups of, you know, guitars, baritone guitars, when you get into baritone guitars, seven string, eight string guitars, I think you're also, you're, you're half guitar, half bass at that point. So try to think about how bass pickups work versus guitar pickups. In other words, they tend to be a little bit, you know, voiced a little differently. I like pickups like EMG. I like pickups like, uh, Fishman for seven string, eight strings. Um, you know, I like pay PAFs, uh, for those kind of guitars. So that's the way I would generally go, but you know, that's not really advice. I'm just telling you what I think and do for myself. Cause like I said, I don't really play baritone. I've owned a couple baritones. It's one of those guitars that I always tell myself, like, I don't have a baritone. I need a baritone. And what I've really learned is that does not work for me. In other words, that the, I don't have it. So I should have it. Um, what I've learned is there's, if I don't have it, there's probably a reason I don't have it. And, um, I'm not going to play it. And that's what happened with baritones. I never play them. I pick them up, I play them. And then a year later I go, man, it's still sitting in that same spot. I love the way they sound. I just don't, I don't have a, I don't have an opportunity to put in any kind of music or do anything with it on a, you know, consistent basis. But I don't know, maybe I'll find a baritone one day and change my mind. Oh, you know what else I love? P90s on baritones, man. Oh, love those. I, in fact, I think if I was going to get a baritone again, I'd get one of P90s. Definitely. Uh, in Cortex says, hey, Phil, base bridge has glued itself to the nitro finish. Uh, won't come by removing screws. Gentle force, how to remove it with minimal damage and finish. Again, I'm not looking at it. This is, um, so it's a little tough to give you advice without looking at it. Um, what I will tell you is that how I normally would handle something like that is a little bit of uh, heat warming up. Uh, the lacquer will all get a little soft. Um, think of it like uh, the cooler it is, the harder it is right? It's kind of sticking. Sometimes, uh, heat is usually how think of this heat and moisture is usually how you separate things on, on a guitar, right? Whether it's acoustic guitar, electric guitar, or bass or something like that. I'm not telling you using moisture in this case, but those two things are usually how you're going to delaminate or take things apart or pull things apart. Um, force is usually, uh, a bad idea. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you're, if you're hitting it or pulling on it really hard, something's going to go bad. So I would think, uh, I would do some research. Okay. But what I'm saying is do the research. Cause there's, there's definitely some probably helpful hints on, on YouTube for that. I, you know, YouTube's a wonder, uh, cause it's just got so much resources, but now you know where to start looking, looking about, you know, look for how to ways to warm that up. My guess is just warm it up a little bit and pull it. Same way we pull a fret. We warm it up a little bit, get the glue to soften. If there's glue, get the lacquer to soften. If the lacquer is a little softer, it's a less likely to crack or chip. So you have a better result. And uh, the only cautionary thing is please don't just do what I just said and just do it like that. Like I said, try to do some research to say, you can probably Google now like best ways to warm up lacquer to get it to, to, um, to soften enough to where you can pry something off of it if it's sticking. So that'll help. The only time I don't, <laughs> uh, the only time I don't recommend that is um, like when you have like Charvels or guitars that wear the, they have metal back plates and they, they're sticking and you can't pull them out. Um, don't, you don't want to warm up the metal. Obviously that expands and then it makes it even worse. But, um, uh, you know, but in most cases, warming stuff up is going to be the best route for you. Um, kind of feel like, <laughs> Michael says, Phil's going to start looking at baritones with P90s. I would, I would, I mean, I'm telling you, I would, but I, I just, I, you know, it's funny. I did it as a, uh, just to be funny, not funny, but interesting, funny. Not only did I just buy this guitar, I should admit, I should admit, I actually bought that guitar as well. Um, that is going to be a video, uh, on that guitar. That's a Schecter. And, um, that is not going to be a good video for me. Uh, I did a video years ago. I'm not going to spoil the video for you guys. I did a video years ago called like why I bought like three or four blues, uh, juniors, right? I mean, I've been talking a long time. It's like it was in the first 10 videos I probably ever made on my YouTube channel. I was like, why well, I've owned three blues juniors, right? Before, before clickbait was clickbait. I was clickbaiting apparently. 
right? And I'm like, why would I do that? And then I explain the stupidity of buying something, selling it and buying it again and selling it and buying it again and selling it. And here all these years later and 300 episodes of giving it uh, insight into what I've done in my life. And I just did it again. That guitar, I, I bought, this is my second time I bought that exact same Schecter guitar in the last two years. Yeah, it's dumb. But I will do a video, not only ex uh, demoing the guitar and showing it off. I did buy that though, full full, pay, full price. Um, and uh, But I'll explain why I bought it and sold it twice. Or bought it, sold it, bought it again. So it's dumb. We're all dumb. I actually, you know what? You guys are probably not dumb. I'm dumb. So just, you know, watch me and learn. Don't do what I do. Okay. Um, Will Roberts, thank you, man. Huge super chat. That was crazy. Thanks. It says, uh, hey, Phil, thanks for all you do. What do you think of Stingray Dark Ray bass? Love. I, look, I love anything music, man. If I'm not, if I'm not interested in the distortion circuits but can I get a good deal on one? Should I pull the trigger? Yeah, look, um, yeah, why not? You don't have to use it. Think of this, Think. Uh, put it in perspective, think all the guitar players that have a tone control and never use it. I think as, as guitar players, we've totally accepted the idea of buying things and then not using anything in it, <laughs> right? We, we buy things all the time with tons of features and don't use the features. So tone, so yeah, you can totally do that. It's great. I don't think that's, I don't think that's a crazy ask for yourself at all. Uh, and then Peter Van, Peter Van Rain says, Robbie from Liverpool asks. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> that's smart. Thanks for saying it like that. Put it in that way. So it just gives me the prompt. It says Robbie from Liverpool asks, is the tube amp dead? Uh, no but it is not what it used to be, of course, right? I mean, it's got a lot of competition. Look, it's just competition, right? Think about, think about it like this way. I've been, you know, this, this is the questions that we get, we bring up week to week to week. And I love it when, uh, the discussion is, uh, you know, like earlier, we got a question. What's the question you get all the time, right? Why a question I get off the show a lot is like, are you, do you ever get sick of answering the same questions? And I, I go, you know, I've learned that the same questions come up. And then over time, we, cause we're, we don't know the answers. We're exploring the answers. So here's what I mean by that. Is the tube amp dead? Is the mom and pop shop dead? Right? These are like, is guitar dead? Uh, no, they're, none of those things are dead. Are they dying? Well, they're changing and not in the best ways in all ways, but think about this way. The tube amp, let's not even talk about the new, like right now you, you got a lot of YouTube channels all talking about it, right? This, this, uh, show is really the is really the whatever you guys watch all damn week that's what we end up talking about right i always laugh sometimes i used to watch a lot of youtube i don't watch as much anymore it's only because i know like i i i started watching well I, when i watch a lot of youtube channels from other, other channels i kind of like walk into friday knowing what you're going to ask i'm like oh i'm sure they're going to talk about that video oh i'm sure they're going to talk about this and i've kind of been trying to pull away from that because i kind of uh you know, it's kind of funner this way. Um, and, but I do know that a lot of channels are talking about like, I got rid of all my amps. I got rid of all my amps. We're getting, I'm getting rid of all my amps. I'm going to digital. And so that brings the, the question is the tube amp dead. And here's what I, I want to say, tell you. I'm going to argue that the, the, when the solid state amp came out, that was the first, let's say, I don't want to say coffin nail, but that was the first moment in history where the tube amp was in trouble right? Because it had a comp competition, right? I think it's just like a tube TV versus a solid state TV, right? It has competition now. That's a different technology, a different way of doing things. So the first thing that happened to tube amp was a solid state amp was competition. We know for the most of us agree that the tube amps were better, right? Not in every situation, but in most situations. Then I would argue the next competitor was not pedals because just pedals were actually additions to tube amps. Think about this. Most of the first pedals were additions, things to make the tube amp better, like a fuzz pedal, right? That's a feature that's not on a tube amp. But the first time they started making distortion pedals or preamp pedals, now that's a little tough because now that's something that can make, you can make an amp, that can make a pedal that sounds like a tube amp, put that in a solid state. So again, start adding this up, right? Then of course, you know, eventually you're gonna get to the, the modelers, right? Which is where we're out. And then you're, I think there's a lot of competition. What I think is about tube amps is this, Oh, there's, they're just so 
freaking great, right? <laughs> right. That's the thing about something that's great. Okay. It's timeless. Is there going to be a time where tube amps aren't practical? Yes. Is there going to be a time where maybe you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on a tube amp and hundreds of dollars on tubes for something that is only slightly better than what you can get with software or some tech? I think that's absolutely true. But do they ever die? No. Here's why. Because they're so freaking great. There's no, I don't think there's ever going to, think about this. The best case scenario for the tube amp is technology gets to a point where they sound almost identical, but that's still not enough to kill the tube amp because the tube amp still sounds great. It'll be a difference between, you know, it's like, think about it like, and I, I hate pulling the analogies from my ass sometimes, but I'm going to do it. It's like the old cars, right? Look, there's a difference, you know, old muscle cars still have something to offer. There's something about getting in that car and going really fast and feeling the way it does and the way it smells and the way it kind of makes you feel. That has a thing, the same with tube amps. There's a thing, but also there's a practicality to tube amps because they're really loud and they do things too. So that's what I'm saying. So I think to your question, you know, is the tube amp dead? It's not dead. Is it dying? Well, it's, it's yes. The answer, technically the answer is yes, it's dying. Just like I said, I think mom and pop brick and mortar stores are dying. When I say dying, I mean shrinking. I should, be, there'll be less of them. There'll be less tube amps in 20 years. I think it's easy to guess. There'll be less mom and pop sh shops in 20 years. That doesn't mean <laughs> if you're a tube amp builder or a connoisseur, or a player of them, or if you own a mom and pop shop, or if you like going to mom and pop shops, there's no reason to freak out. Just you understand you're going to have less. That's all. There, there will be more of the other thing and less of the thing. Just like now, you, you can buy records still. You can put them on your record player. They're just not on every corner like they used to be when the record stores, you know, there's a record store in every mall, you know, um, there's just going to be a little different. So uh, that's my take on that. And like I said, I, I and that's saying something because I, I really love my Kemper for the practical use of it. And I really like that HX Stomp, uh, so you know, as a pedal. Um, so, I mean, I like modeling stuff. I use software, as you guys know, I have software on both my computers, my laptop and this computer for using stuff with the interface and love all that stuff. And I still have tube amps and I still have no desire to not use the tube amps. Um, you know, I just go, you know, they have perp, they have things I like. There's like, this works great because it's all modeled and ready to go and I can plug and play and this is, goes great. And then, you know, the other thing has a, a magic too. So, and to me, uh, uh, the magic of two amps is different for everybody too, by the way. Some people think the magic is in the tone of the distortion. Some people's magic in the way it feels, makes your like leg, your pant leg flap because it's so loud. Some people, the way it's on stage. Two amps for me is all about the clean channel for me. Like there's just something about when a two amp, you know, when you play a good two amp and it's clean, there's just something about that clean that I just have trouble finding. And I think a compression pedal gets me really close to that, just the way it kind of compression pedals work and with modelers, but, and using it with a modeler, but there's just something about that tube amp clean that I just, man, when it's, even when it's not totally clean, it's just breaking up a little bit. There's something about that sweet spot that I always feel like I just love. So, um, unfreaking believable says, who's a moderator, by the way, says, Hey, which guitars did you get rid of to buy the PRS? And why wasn't I your first call? So I didn't get rid of the guitars yet. Here's why I, um, I, I will, um, I'll tell you why I learned this lesson. This is a hard, horrible lesson I learned. Um, <laughs> I had a basement 59 It's one of my favorite guitar amps of all time. Okay. It was a reissue. I didn't have the original one reissue basement 59 to put it in reference. It was probably 2005 sounds right. 2004, 2004, 2004 had a base 59. I don't know what they were going for back then. Probably a thousand bucks new, um, bought this amp, loved it. Okay. To this day, one of the amps that's just most, to me, it's just everything about a, a, a Fender Bassman, 59 Bassman. Fender 59 Bassman is just perfect. I love the way it looks. I love the tweed. I like the vibe. I like the tens. I like the punch. I like to just crank the damn thing and hear it roar like a marshal. I like running pedals through it. I love everything about this amp. I love it. Pine box. Love it. This is why it's an important lesson to learn. But I didn't love one thing. It didn't have reverb really needs reverb. So 2000, I keep going 2003, four. It's th it's probably 2003 or 2004. Um, so anyways, love the amp. Wish I had a reverb. One day I was at Milano's music, which is in, in Mesa, downtown Mesa, Arizona. And I was uh, walking in the store at a lunch. I think I was at lunch and I saw the hot rod DeVille 
no, not Hot Rod DeVille, Blues DeVille. Blues DeVille by Fender, which is the 410 uh, version of the Blues Deluxe. So, so a tweed, not lacquered though. Tweed, 410s, different 10 inch, different branded 10 inch speakers. Has an overdrive channel, clean channel, and reverb. I don't remember particularly liking the overdrive panel. I don't remember anything about it, like negative or positive. I just remember like playing, plugging in that store, hearing the reverb, going reverb. I need reverb. I know I was using a pedal at the time, but just the idea of having it all one amp sounds great. So at that time, this is what I had to do. I had to do this. I went home and I sold my base 59. Took the money. Drink for a dramatic pause. No, I took the money and I went to Milano's and I bought that uh, uh, Blues DeVille uh, 410. Took it home and played it. Went, best decision I ever made. I don't think I lasted a week. And I was like, you know, I don't know. That 59 basement was nice. Months, months go by. And uh, I see a basement 59, 59 basement in a guitar center. I think it was the Tempe Guitar Center. Uh, again, at lunch, because I would take lunch, go check out my stores. And uh, walked in, plugged into it. And in the first two chords, I went, oh, this is it. And of course, now that amp was $200, $300 more than what I paid for it when I bought it new. And to basically sell the DeVille and then buy that, it was going to cost me, I think all in all, I'd probably cost me five, $600. I think that's what it was like, at least 500 bucks. Again, factor inflation, just insane amount of money, right? I mean, it's a lot of money now, but I mean, for those two products, you know, to basically get back where you started and be out $500 was very dramatic. And um, so here's what the lesson learned is, which is why I'm saying about the guitar. I don't care what anything costs, right? Um, I don't care if it's an expensive item and it's at the top of my budget. I don't care if it's a cheap item. If I'm replacing a piece of gear with a new piece of gear, uh, I do not sell the piece of gear. I'm, I'm, you know, the old piece of gear until I know I like the new piece of gear because it will always end up more expensive. I don't care if I have to borrow the money off the credit card or what do I got to do? You know, right. Usually I just, like I said, I have a, like a little slush fund, you know, for, for my gear and I kind of keep it under control, but um, I, so I know, like, so like I said, I'll, I, that's why I said it takes a while. Trust me on this guitar. That's why I said, think about this guitar, you know, to get this guitar, it took years. It took years to find the right one at the right price, the right time, you know? So, and everywhere, all the stars have to line. I have to have the money in the account. I have to, ha it has to be a deal. It has to be the one I want. <laughs> and if I can do all those things and I have to have what I know I'm going to be getting rid of, and then I execute. So I bought this guitar. I do love this guitar. I am keeping this guitar, obviously. And so therefore I'll be selling off some guitars to get it. What I think I'm going to sell, I won't know because here's why. I kind of want to get close to it when I sell the guitars. I know it's close to the price I paid for this. So I'm thinking, believe it or not, what I'm thinking of selling is my uh, semi-hollow white Vela, which I absolutely love. But again, you don't want, re I don't want redundant guitars. That's semi-hollow. This is semi-hollow. The question is not, do I love the Vela? The question is, will I play the Vela now that I have this? I don't know. Um, and so if the Vela goes, that's great. If not, the Vela will stay and I have a semi hollow PRS S2 single cut. So that will be go, not both, but one of those will go. So it'll have to, you know, eventually over time, figure it out. But one of those guitars will go the green SG. I have an olive green, uh, limited run, uh, Chicago music exchange SG. Um, it's a flawless guitar. It even has a hard shell case. It sounds great. It plays great. Everything about it's great. I don't know why. Don't ask me why it's on the chopping block. Probably because I have a lot of SGs. And for some reason, even though I think it's my favorite color of all the SGs I have, it's my least favorite one of the bunch. So, so anyway, so like I said, so that's the basic thing. And then, uh, so that's two of the guitars I'm thinking about. And I also, I have two PRS hollow bodies and one of them is going to go. So, and like I said, and then how that will all be decided. And that's why I said, I'm see how I'm saying it like this. Those are the guitars on chopping block. I will sell them. And then basically as I sell them, you know, I say I'm getting rid of, let's say that's three guitars, but what's really going to happen is, is once I get to the price of what I paid for this, I'll, I won't sell them. You know what I mean? I won't sell any more of them. So I might sell two. So if the expensive one sells, then I'll sell the expensive one and a lesser price one. If two of the lesser price ones sell, then I might have to sell, you know, three guitars. You see how that works? But that's the answer on that. That's kind of how I do it. But the important part of the story is, um, don't sell gear to buy gear. Uh, and like I said, always make sure you, you, know you, you, the new gear is better.
Blue, Blue Hawk says, I'm still waiting for Phil to swear on the podcast. I've actually done it a bunch of times. I did it last week, I think. Last week. It happens, man. You just got to catch it. It's fast. Okay, let's button this up. We got a weekend to start. Long, a long weekend. Hopefully, you spend it with some family. Like I said, a lot of you guys probably had graduations. I had a graduation. Um, the um, Okay. Uh, music Therapy Laz, what's up, buddy? He says, Phil. Boss, SDE 3000 EVH on its way. Any suggestions for bedroom level, wet, dry, wet? I have no idea. Um, so I got that email to me from a bunch of guys. As you guys, uh, if you guys don't know, Boss did an EVH um, pedal dual delay thing for the wet, dry thing. I watched a video because I saw the pedal and I so I watched a video of a guy on YouTube. Uh, just a guy, like a, you know, guy making a video and he made a video of a wet, dry rig using his Marshall, uh, like JC100 and a, a EVH and... Um, and, uh, you know, I have to say, I'm not really versed in the wet dry wig. I know a rig. I know what it is. I know how to accomplish it. I've probably hooked it up once or twice in the past, like as a thing, but, um, I'm more of a minimalist when it comes to the rigs. Like I don't have a really elaborate rig. That's why my pedal board's small. That's why everything's small, you know, like an amp. I'm still more of a, like a, just guitar, maybe a couple of pedals into an amp. And the more complicated it gets, you gotta, you gotta understand it's years and years of all my playing is in bass playing where it's like, you just show up with a bass and an amp. So my guitar stuff, I just can't get it too elaborate like that. Um, so I, I don't know. It was an interesting thing to come out. I was really shocked about it. It's one of those things I, I wouldn't have predicted as a, as a product to come out. So I don't have any suggestions for you other than have fun. Three days to do that all weekend. T-Size says, happy Friday, Phil. Thoughts on the current BC Rich? Um, <laughs> is it worth sticking uh, to their old gear over their new stuff? Any thoughts on it? I don't know what's going on in BC Rich. It feels... If there's a company, it feels lost as a company, you know, I don't know. You know, it's one of those things where you like to say, um, it's one of those things where I could easily so cavalier be like, oh, it's so easy. This is what they need to do. Um, but I don't know what they need to do. I can tell you though, BC Rich, in my opinion, BC Rich and Kramer. In order, I'm going to say Kramer, then Beast Rich, then Jackson. Yeah. In, in, my, in my opinion, because so I'm repeating because I want to make sure I'm right when I'm saying. In my opinion, it's Kramer in order of most to least. Kramer, Beast Rich, and then Jackson is the reason why Badlands got started as a guitar. Because it was like, there isn't that type of guitar in existence. So, like, you got to understand, think about it like this way, like, I, I don't own a gunslinger. They're a fantastic guitar. It's a guitar. Like, uh, that's one of those guitars. Like the gunslinger is one of the first guitars I walked into the store. And I went, Whoa, it's just a beast. It's just a beast rich, you know, super strat with one pickup. And, uh, now they make beast rich gunslingers are $3,000. They come in like three colors, right? They're obviously not made by beast rich because beast rich doesn't have a U.S. facility. So they're just OEM and like, you know, having them ghost build everywhere, which is totally fine. It's how the Badlands and stuff is done. We pick the shop and we have the shop build this stuff. However, that's my whole, that's our whole point, right? Um, think about what we did. And I mean this, no insult. I, I, I like Bill, the guy who runs BC rich. Um, I, mean, I don't know him, but I mean, I like his character and I like the company, but I mean, look, the Badlands GX one is literally a slap in that face. And, it, and, um, you can go right now and buy yourself a gunslinger in purple for $3,000 with one pickup and a case, or you could have bought the GX one with a custom graphic and for $500 less. Obviously that's exactly what we're doing. Same with the Kramer guitars, the Kramer guitars, you know, they don't make any USA models right now. So we're like, Oh, well, here's a USA made guitar for with, you know, Kramer vibed out with the eighties vibe. And then be, uh, Jackson does make those guitars, but they're $6,000. I'm not exaggerating. That's what they cost. They're $6,000 for a custom shop. Uh, $4,000 for a, just a solid color model, uh, Jackson custom shop. And so that, so to ask, answer your question, what is Beast Rich doing? I have no idea what Beast Rich is doing because um, I don't understand what they're after. So you got to understand, to my, in my mind, are they after, to me, BC Rich, okay, so let's, let's just play this game real fun, real fast. Because we did this once with PV. If I was helping Beast Rich or if I, Beast Rich, if I could give Beast Rich some of my opinions, first thing I would do is cut Beast Rich into two companies, uh, literally two, not two physical companies, but two, um, the old school and the new school, right? So you would literally create 
whatever the new school is, I don't know who that, what that is, right? Is it a Solar copy? Is it is Skirvison? Is it, you know, uh, Aristides? Is it Mayanez, right? Is it the new? It's new, right? But make Beast Rich new, right? Which I know they do that, basically. That's what you see, right? Like, they have... They have um they have that idea they do that and then old school and old school sh old school should be be for the dudes who are just like all the people who wanted to be riches when they were younger who couldn't get them now they can just buy them and live their you know their bedroom fantasies with the guitars right and um, that's where the money's gonna come from look you need the future that's why Fender needs to focus on Coachella and younger artists and getting younger artists to play guitars that's exactly you know you know where they're gonna be in twenty years if they don't grab kids but how they're gonna pay to grab those kids, how are they going to pay for the marketing to grab those kids? They're going to sell them to middle-aged dudes and women, right? Men and women who are middle-aged, who are like, this is what I wanted when I was younger, and now I can afford it. That's how I think a lot of companies that are have a, has, have a history like that should focus on that, right? Um, same with Gibson. Make, make, you know, when people make fun of Les Pauls, like, who's buying these expensive Les Pauls? Lawyers and doctors? Yeah. Sounds like the coolest lawyer and doctor I could hire. If I hired a lawyer, I'd want him to be, own a couple of Gibsons. <laughs> I just kind of feel like I'd like to be able to like, yeah, thanks. Please send that document out. And by the way, that was really cool. That's Paul you had in your, in your office. Um, but my point is, is that make the cool, uh, affordable gear for the kids, make the expensive stuff for the, for the middle-aged people who are trying to fulfill those dreams. And then also you got to understand the expensive stuff also helps them develop ideas and then make that stuff affordable. You know, one thing that people forget all the time when they're complaining, because they do on the internet, I don't know if you heard that, about expensive guitars, is that no cheap guitars usually come first. It's very rarely does it have that happen that way. You do not see cool cheap guitars just out of the blue. They come from expensive guitars. That's usually how the marketing is done. You make an expensive guitar, we all drool over it and go, man, if it was affordable, we'd buy it. And then they make the affordable guitar. That's usually how the marketing is done. So when people complain about the expensive guitars, keep in mind, those are where the cheap guitars come from or the more affordable. I know I use word cheap, cheap and stuff and expensive, but you understand affordable versus, uh, you know, not so affordable. Um, that's where it's coming from. So same with Beast Rich, right? You develop some cool old school reissue stuff, right? Make a cool old school reissue, Warlocks, whatever, um, bitches. Um, uh, gunslingers, all that stuff, <laughs> make that stuff expensive. And then, uh, and let, uh, you know, people buy them that wanted to buy them and then make that money and take that money and then go after younger markets with some, some more practical price guitars that are really cool and maybe more forward thinking. I think that's a good idea. Um, it doesn't seem like a hard strategy to implement. Um, Beast Rich 581 says, Ivan has started out cheap initially. That's actually funny enough. You say that, but that's not what what you're saying does is not aligned with what I'm saying, but hold on for a second. First of all, Ibanez currently runs that strategy. I just said, so think about this. It's not even my strategy. When you think of Ibanez, it's exactly what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. They make, they make a $3,000, $4,000 Steve Vai guitar for nostalgic Steve Vai fans. And then they make a more affordable premium premium being the series line for the people who like Polyphia. Because the people who like Bolivia are in their teens or 20s and they don't have $4,000 to throw down on a guitar because they're too busy trying to figure out how they're going to afford a house for in their life. So you got to understand everybody's in a different stage. So this is, and again, we're just talking business now. So this is, like I said, I'm just going for the business logic. So that's how you divide a strategy up to where you go. This is how we're going to sell big dollar items. It's going to sell affordable items. On the idea, idea that Ivan has started out cheap initially, that is not true. Ivan has started out copying people and they couldn't be effective if they weren't copying somebody proving my point even more so what i'm saying 581 so that my point is is that ibanez was nowhere if they weren't copying that's my whole point all the affordable guitars come from copying expensive guitars even if it's own if it's own it's its own brand or if it's another brand again you need the expensive guitars first it's kind of like when i have arguments with expensive guitar companies by the way because they like to complain sometimes big expensive companies they like they, they complain especially about youtube channels because they're like why are you guys always talking about 200 dollars guitars i'm like well it's because your mass mass amount of youtube people on youtube are trying to learn something number one thing you need to understand about youtube is is that the majority of people on youtube are trying to learn a thing that is an absolute fact is where most people People go to TikTok. Well, whatever. I'm too old to understand why people go to TikTok. TikTok and Instagram, they go for 10, 10 second entertainments, 
right? Whatever it is. People go to YouTube to learn a thing. It's an absolute fact. It's why the majority of videos on YouTube are called how to. How to is the number one search category pretty much on YouTube, probably next to cats. So my point with this is, is that by knowing that one piece of information on YouTube, that tells you that the majority of people on YouTube are beginners of something, <laughs> whether that's guitars or our, uh, you know, fishing or hiking or whatever, right? <laughs> you know, home repair. So they're looking for information. So of course, if I make a video on this extremely expensive PRS, there's a small market looking for that guitar. However, somebody is trying to buy their first acoustic and having a someone like me, who's been a guitar tech for decades, show them why this might be a good or bad purchase would be really helpful to them, especially if I can keep it understandable to them. Okay, so that, my point being, when I talk to the expensive guitar companies, I also remind them, no one is buying this guitar until they buy the $200 guitar. In other words, it's a progression. Very rarely do you see somebody go, hey, I'm thinking about playing guitar tomorrow. I think I'll buy the private stock PRS or whatever they're gonna buy, or a Gibson, you know, R9. No, it's, they start with an affordable guitar. So the 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 way you sell expensive guitars is either is not be, by making people really good players, really good players play whatever they like, and sometimes that could be an expensive guitar. You sell expensive guitars by making players connoisseurs. In other words, over time they start learning like why this guitar being one percent better might be better for them, and and that doesn't mean they have to buy expensive. It just means. You know, they go, oh, you know what? Yeah, I noticed now what you're talking about. This guitar does, oh yeah, I like how they kind of do that. Or I like these pickups. And so little improvements. But like I said, by the way, BC, which uh, 581, 581, we generally agree on the same topic. I just wanted to point out that one little caveat, which is I've been as, did start out as a company, copy company for as at our generation. That's what I'm saying. I know if we go back, they were classical guitar company, but you understand what I'm saying. So. I still hold, I'll still hold until somebody can really change my mind. I'm going to hold the I, idea that no good guitars come out as ex, inexpensive first, you know, as a design. It's always expensive guitars and then they get put out as more obtainable, affordable versions. <coughs> okay, I'm at the end of my voice. Let's see if I can finish up these uh, last three questions. Vim69 says, any hints when the next Badlands guitar will be announced? It's sadly enough, it's not going to get announced until the GX ones are shipped. I have the timeline on the GX ones. Uh, I, like I said, I'm doing the first 20 ones. It's basically going to happen really soon in the next couple of days. Obviously, I didn't have to drive today. I really didn't want to drive today, so it kind of worked out. So that worked out, um, <laughs> but it's happening right now. And then the second 25 will get shipped out uh, the following week or a week later, something like that. I, uh, again, I saw it. I just care about what I have to do. I have inspection sheets and stuff I want to go through and help and see, you know, make sure if I can help everybody get them out, get them, get them done. Um, however, that being said, once that's done, it will probably shortly after that announce the next model. And that's just how that will go. Uh, Paul Gilbert's God. God. Paul Gilbert is God. Great sign on. Hey, Phil, new guitar week. Nile Rogers Strat. What do you think? Love Nile Rogers. Love Strats. I mean, it's a, it's a great guitar. It's like one of those things where <coughs> I'm losing my voice totally now. Um, it's one of those things where I can't own everything. <laughs> so it's why that guitar, I don't own that guitar. But otherwise, like being a Nile Rodgers fan and being a Strat fan. Yeah. So um, so you've got a great guitar coming. And then Christopher, last question, says acoustic Gibson versus Martin. Why best investment? So I don't know about investments. I mean, both guitars are, if you buy the guitar, here's the deal. You're not comparing two guitars that are apples and oranges. To me, they're both very good acoustics that are uh, traditionally hold value and sound, you know, hold value very well. So whether you buy a Martin or a Gibson, uh, I think you'll be fine depending on, depending. I mean, let's be honest. If you buy some of the Gibsons with the, that I like with the hole on the side, I forget what they're called. And some of the Martins that are made in Mexico and stuff, they're fantastic guitars. Both those guitars, I would say, if you're going for quality and sound and I love them, but if you're going for investments, those aren't really the investments type guitars from Martin Gibson. I don't have a, I don't have a clear winner of those two. I feel like you're fine either way. The, the harder question, the easier question would be like, you know, Gibson versus an Ibanez acoustic or Martin versus a Fender acoustic. I mean, that's an easy thing. But usually, usually speaking, traditionally speaking, um, first of all, I always I always try to shy away from the advice of investing in guitars. I don't know if I 
truly believe it's a great idea. I, I, I see a lot of people make money buying guitars and holding them, investing them. Um, but I really believe a lot of times that it's just, they're buying what they love. And if they're doing that, you know, it just makes it easy. So same with you buy the acoustic you love and, uh, it'll, it'll probably work out. <laughs> if you love it, somebody else probably loves it. Probably the right guitar to buy and hold on to. And then on that note, I think we're going to call it. Um, so like I said, thank you guys. 744 likes has definitely got to be the record on a live, on our live show ever, 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 ever. And so thank you for so much for that. Uh, and, uh, thank you guys for dealing with my voice today. Like I said, I didn't drink the coffee. I drank a couple sips and I'm like, I don't think it was going to work, but it was a nice try. Um, anyways, I hope you guys enjoy the three day weekend. I hope you guys spend some time with your loved ones and your family, your friends, play some guitar because why not? And, um, and, uh, like I said, hopefully I'll do a video of this guitar. I have some cool videos coming out this week too, as well. So look for those. And, um, as always, I just want to thank you guys so much for your time till next time, next Friday, uh, know your gear. If I can find the screen. Oh, there it is. <laughs>